everybody, and welcome to this Democratic Marxism Theory Seminar. This is basically our penultimate uh, theory seminar for the year. We're going to be having a public discussion on feminism and Marxism, the complex relations, on the 10th of October at 5 p.m. That's going to be advisor, so please diarize that. Um, but that will bring to culmination this, year, this year's exciting uh, theory and public lecture series. As you all know, today we're going to be focusing on BRICS, sub-imperialism in Africa, and we have some great uh, guests to take us through this particular thematic. But before, and I'm not going to introduce them, I'm going to hand over to, to Patrick to kind of nail that down. But just to say and to remind people, I mean, the, the democratic Marxism space is about recognizing that Marxism as a body of thought is unfinished. It's also recognizing that the categories and uh, inherent conceptions within Marxism have to be put to work in a new reality. So that we're really theorizing afresh what's going on in the world of accumulation, of capitalism, of globalization, and so on. So that's broadly our kind of intellectual imperatives and project that we've been busy with. The Democratic Marxism uh, Theory and Public Lecture Series uh, is going to continue next year. We have an exciting program planned for next year. We'll be kicking off with Leading Capital in the 21st century in February of next year. We have Alfredo Sarfudo will be coming from SOAS, um, also from Brazil, who will be working with us three days Leading Capital. We'll then have uh, a theory seminar on the climate crisis, uh, democratic eco-socialist alternatives. That's going to be in April. Um, that's going to be in March. In April, we're going to have a theory seminar on transnational class analysis and fossil fuel capitalism today. And then, of course, later in the year, we're going to have a series of engagements on Marx and South African Marxism. It's 200 years of celebrating Marx next year, so we're going to be revisiting that question. And we're going to be having a, um, a guest Visiting us, maybe from Canada, um, Glenn Coulthard, who's written a book, Redskins, White Masks. We'll probably read that text and, and then, of course, engage around those ideas. We'll probably culminate the year with a theory seminar on racism after apartheid, and it's also linked to a book project. The other point, just to register, is that this series, this theory and seminar series, is also linked to a book project. Uh, the third volume in the series, which we'll workshop next year, is coming out. We just got an endorsement from Naomi Klein. It's on the climate crisis, um, and it's really looking squarely at systemic alternatives for the just transition. Uh, what, are the, what is the climate justice movement saying about the way forward in the current context? Uh, what are its propositions? What are its alternatives from below and so on? So that's going to be a very valuable contribution, both to the South African and international conversation around alternatives and particularly the renewal of socialism as democratic eco-socialism. So this is the kind of space you're in. Um, without saying anything further, maybe just to say that at the tail end of today, at about quarter to one, when I step back up here, um, I'm going to invite you to answer the question, what can we do together next year, given that South Africa is hosting the BRICS summit? Are there any research topics we can take up together? Are there any activities we should be thinking about and so on together around collaboration? So please keep that question in mind, and we'll come back to it at the end of this. But I'm now going to hand over to Patrick, and he'll basically introduce our guests who have come from Brazil, and he'll also kind of explain some of the other issues around us. To say we've sent out the readings to everyone, we've had about 30 confirmations before we conclude. Thank you. It's such a great opportunity. Um, and although we'll start really with uh, Anna uh, giving a bit more description of the um, terrain theoretically we're, we're wandering through, the question of sub-imperialism, I think I would like actually us to do a little bit more with us on what is the importance of Marxism for international relations, because in a kind of independent way, Anna's more or less uh, capitalizing debates in Brazil around Marxism and IR. And as Vishwas has so usefully done here, and they actually have a common uncle from Toronto, Leo Panage. Do you remember some of you were here in March last year? And Leo's um, sometimes accused of being Washington-centric. Is, is that fair? The Empire, and Leo and his colleague Sam Dinden have just done such brilliant work in exposing 
the core of US imperialism. So we're really happy that in spite of our not particularly signing on to all of the theoretical framing that Leo uh, uses, we have a very vibrant debate that I learned about because of the comrades around Leo who said, Patrick, if you're working on BRICS in 2013 as BRICS came to Durban, where I was based, then you're going to have to get to know Ana Garcia, Karina Cato, and there were a few activists who had a similar orientation. They all said, yeah, it's Ana Garcia for critical analysis. And that was at a time in the BRICS Policy Center in Rio, which was like, uh, is anyone here from SIA before I become insulting about uh, Theorizing imperialism, some imperialism, uh, in a positive way. Nobody here from SIA, right? But SIA, as you know, has a very strong ideological role in promoting Western neoliberal orientations to public policy. And there's a similar outfit in, in Rio. But they're doing it differently because they've got uh, a BRICS unit of analysis that they need to then spin. And how do I were they in January? Because you remember what happened in January this year in Davos, Switzerland? Does anybody pay attention to the World Economic Forum? Who was the greatest promoter of free markets and corporate globalization? Xi Jinping. Donald Trump was about to be inaugurated as the US president based on a campaign promise of putting on 45% um, uh, import tariff against Chinese goods. He's not going to do it. He's uh, obviously have been pushed and pulled by various forces. But this was the moment we understood that at some point imperialism passes on the baton. So we've seen that in world history, you know, from Italians to Dutch to British uh, to the US. Is this the question now for uh, our uh, discussion? Is there a, uh, a new imperialism and maybe inter-imperial rivalry? Or, as I think we would want to argue a bit more today, and we're going to have somebody joining us by Skype, if it all works, who doesn't take our point of view, that instead of anti-imperialism or sometimes inter-imperialism, sub-imperialism. And that really comes from Brazil. Um, so before we ask Ana to go through, and Karina, who will give us a, a beautiful case study of Brazilian capital in conjunction with Japanese capital in Mozambique, pro Savannah, and not only resistance from below in Mozambique, but cross-border solidaristic resistance stretching to Karina's group, uh, note the pro Savannah. Before we do that, and before Anna, and I also, I should uh, confess, I have my own course in this race, which is uh, running parallel to Marie, and that's the theor theoretical framing by David Harvey. I was a PhD student of Harvey, because most, most of the house knows Harvey has a geopolitical approach that's based not like Leo Panitch on the agency of Washington, but on the structural logic of capital towards overaccumulation crisis and amplified uneven and combined development. And that framing to me requires, and David Harvey's been very useful in locating, the deputy sheriff position. That's the sub imperial position that David Harvey introduces that I could pick up for a few minutes to, to explain as well. So we wanted to do um, the first hour or so on this topic, and then uh, you know have a little break, a little stretch, and then move into some Africa concrete analyses that include the Brazilian work, which particularly uh, the wonderful study of bilateral investment treaties that most of you got the paper that was from Anna in uh, uh, Research uh, studies in political economy, is it? Uh, no, the uh, Institute for Political Economy in the South. Okay. Nice. So, Cox yeah, was the host, but you published it in, in one of the. Oh, yeah, the, the Journal of Studies in Political Economy. And that, that journal article you already had this year. But we're also looking, we have a couple of uh, pieces in major books, at South Africa as a sub imperial power in Africa and all of its manifestations. Don't forget, this isn't just about the micro connections of our companies that go to Central African Republic and need SANDF, or Kulabusi Zuma, the site of the DRC and needs us. That's, that's sort of uh, maybe too vulgar. There's a much bigger process of shoring up imperialism through multilateral institutions that we're going to rest our case upon. That ranges from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, to the IMF, to the WTO, to the, come on, let's face it, I'll end here as an intro. Who is hosting the World Cup of soccer next year? Russia. Russia. Who hosted it in 2014? 
they're still angry about that. They posted it and lost the drug 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 drug. So I'm just going to tell you at the outset. If you have a problem, a mafia sitting up in Missouri, well, FIFA. <laughs> and we even had a great mafia who said boss until uh, our bribery undid him through the FBI, right? Set ladder. And we have a, a, a Tsotsi here, right, who found $10 million to give to Jack Warner and Chuck Blazer, the FIFA sub Tsotsis, to make sure we got the World Cup in 2010. You know this story, right? That's imperialism in Zurich, is it not? So which countries are the sub imperialists nurturing, financing, and legitimating if it's not the Brits? Okay, so that's my thing. You can't argue with me now. That's sub imperialism, and we're going to have Anna um, quickly give us a little bit of a sense of it, um, collaborating actively in the bigger imperial project as a deputy sheriff. But what do you think? Do you want to just say, what is Marxism and IR? Why do we need this, right? Do you want to just tell us that to, to start us off? Well, okay, I mean, Okay. In international relations, as you know, is, is really a discipline that comes out of local law. And it's particularly centered on legitimating uh, hegemonic intellectual formations. I mean, it's theory, it's ideas, it's constructs, really legitimate current configurations of power. So Marxism, in my view, has been a dissident voice in relation to that. And that's because Marxism has a perspective around the nature of capitalism as a, on a global scale, um, as an oppressive system, and, and Marxism, even in its neo-Marxist incarnations, has really tried to problematize that. It has also tried to look at the dialectic of that relationship, the role of anti-imperialists. Um, and I think Marxism, particularly over the past few decades, has lost its, its own hegemonic place in the academy. So it's been struggling. And, and I think today, uh, particularly in the light of the kind of global restructuring of capitalism and so on, uh, Marxism has been finding its way back. And it's finding its way back also marked by a whole new range of struggles on the horizon. It's finding its way back in relation to the rising indigenous struggles in the world, new anti-racist movements in the world, uh, movements demanding an alternative globalization, uh, movements wanting a more just world order and so on. So I think Marxism, um, in trying to understand how imperialism works today, uh, in trying to understand how anti-imperialism is articulating itself, has an important place uh, in the academy, uh, in movements, and so on. I think, I think the last point I'll make is that it's also a Marxism that's not about affirming the orthodoxies of the 20th century, but it should, should be a Marxism that's not about that. I mean, Lenin looked at a particular moment in the development of capitalism. Uh, his thesis is important, but, um, you know, on, on, on just on a few things. Um, the dominant power in the world today is not a colonial <laughs> set of colonial states. It's the United States, okay? That's a fundamental difference from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, if we're looking at patterns of transnationalizing of capital, yes, uh, there was a particular relationship between bank and industrial capital that he articulated, if you can it, but it's much more complex today in the way financialization has worked, okay? Um, the issue of how capital inscripts and enlists hegemonic uh, power structures and how it organizes itself today, the depth of those institutional arrangements, very different from Lenin's time. Okay? And it does bring, bring us to the question of whether uh, sub-imperialism and inter-imperialist rivalries and so on fit into this new global power structure. And that's where the debate's lie. I'm going to stop there. What is Marxism and IR in Brazil? What does it mean? Well, First of all, I'm very uh, surprised that you guys here are also discussing this. I was just telling Vish that we did last year an international seminar on IR with this name, IR Marxism, which of course you know, has provoked a lot of attention in the IR field in general. Uh, and we had, surprisingly, about like 150 students per day. We had three days uh, debates. And we've divided it in uh, Marxist analysis of IR subjects, themes, phenomena, such as uh, peacekeeping, <laughs> uh, regional integration, 
how to look at those phenomena through uh, Marx's lens, through class lens, through struggles, what is the concept of the state that we can have to debate this, um, what is the market and state relations, and then we discuss this theoretic, especially concepts of hegemony and imperialism. So many people came from different perspectives, uh, but what is common to all of us is that we cannot analyze international relations without looking to markets, to the bourgeoisie as a class that has been always that has always been cosmopolitan, has always been uh, international, and the working class connections that has you know been kept uh, nationally. Uh, 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 um, in their own countries, but actually, since the beginning, it was always an international class connection. So we uh, didn't go exactly in the same way as we uh, said to the to the 20th century only. We are discussing uh, issues that are you know important for you know, the Brazilian context, but also generally uh, nowadays. So it was really really interesting, and I'm very happy that you know we find this connection here too. And maybe you can even you know work together in the near future. Great. Yeah. Um. Great. Well, Ana Garcia did doctoral work all over, uh, ending up at uh, Federal University of Rio, the rural uh, federal university, and has also been at um, Free University working with Elmer Alfonter and York University with Leo Panich, and then did work with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation who are our sponsors here. They brought uh, Anna uh, and uh, the um, uh, Sao Paulo office, and then also uh, the BRICS Policy Center before uh, starting this academic work that's more independent. And the group PAX, which is your intellectual network and home of progressive critics of Brazilian foreign policy and Latin America in the region, uh, in, in the world, you, you'll tell us a little bit about PAX. We have a few of the Publications for those speaking Portuguese. You have some wonderful tax documents here. And so it's great to have Anna. We did co edit in 2015 Brits, an anti capitalist critique, I think uh, somewhere here. This was the most recent tax study, which we're going to address after the, um, after the little break we take. But this book here has um, a great many names that you'll know and love, uh, including local younger scholars who are working with us to locate BRICS companies in Southern Africa and Africa. Um, and I hope uh, what we'll do, okay, nobody from Jakarta is nearby, send me an email, I'll send you the book by PDF, okay? We thought we'd have a few here to show you, to, to sell them. Oh, you're sending out, okay, that's great. So it's called Decommodification. Um, and this, uh, this book has been well received as probably the first statement of this uh, trend towards analyzing the BRICS from a, a more critical standpoint. We're not really ready for an update. There's been so much amazing research, including work that several of our colleagues through the National Institute of Humanity and Social Sciences have done here. Uh, there's a group called BRICS from Below that is located both in that terrain and then now internationally. And because BRICS is being um, held next year, it's likely June, July, it's likely Santon, maybe Cape Town, but probably Santon. Um, we'll need to get ourselves skilled in analyzing uh, this. And as I'll, I'm going to make a, a statement a little bit later, Jacob Zuma one month ago was in Pongola. Does anybody know what Jacob Zuma said that should make this hone in this question of whether BRICS is anti imperialist or sub imperialist? Does anybody know what Jacob Zuma told his constituents, the ANC Padre? Did anybody hear that? It was somehow kept silent to me, but it should be explosive. You know what he said? He said, I was poisoned in 2014, and I nearly died because, as the leader of South Africa, I brought South Africa into the BRICS. The prior November, he had said much the same, not the poisoning part, uh, at another ANC cadres gathering in Peter Maritzburg. And if for those of you who know the Fanonian tradition of critique of bad nationalism, as it goes sour, as it adopts more of the neo-colonial uh, mentalities, it must talk left even more so it can walk right. I think this is what we're going to be seeing a good deal more of in coming weeks uh, as geopolitical tensions mount globally and as we prepare for more ANC electoral shenanigans. So if Jacob Zuma wants to say that the BRICS are anti-imperialist and that by virtue of that the Western countries said 
we're going to poison that guy from South Africa. That's the narrative. Um, we have to be prepared to say, actually, let's look at this more scientifically. And for that, we have a wonderful concept called seven periods. Take it away. Well, first of all, thank you very much for welcoming us here. Um, thank you so much, Patrick and Rich, for the invitation. I start apologizing for my bad English. I'm <laughs> sorry for any mistakes in advance. It's not my mother language. I do the best as I can. Uh, and thank, of course, to uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for being here as well. We're going after South Africa to Maputo, where we've been now for the third time, uh, with the connection of the uh, alliance against the Brazilian mining company Vale. We're going to participate in a conference there as well, of course, to present our research that you know, are connected with that reality with that struggle. Uh, but it's very interesting because it's you know not common, not usual that you know we're for the third time here in Africa. We don't have any money, you know, to travel around our university, the public one. Uh, but it has to do with I think. You know, some solid uh, research, solid uh, uh, writing, solid academic work uh, connected with social struggles, connected with that reality. So I think that this has a result somehow, right? Even though it doesn't get really well paid for you that it's here in the university, um, it, it does has you know some impacts in uh, along you know this time that we've been spending been researching on. Brazil, uh, Brazilian capital in Africa since 2012. We went to Angola and Mozambique and then to the Mozambique uh, state of Tete and Akala in the north of Mozambique uh, two times and now we're going to be there for the, for the third time connected with our, our comrades there. So Patrick introduced uh, me, I you know, uh, have studied in political science in, in Germany I went back to Brazil and was working for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Sao Paulo, and then I did a PhD afterwards in Brazil uh, in international relations. So I come from political science to IR, and IR, as you know, is very much you know connected, has grew uh, along with U.S. foreign policy and the confrontation in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. So Marxism was never a theory or never a kind of uh, thought that could be brought in as IR theory, but uh, yet yeah, we still can uh, try to bring it in another you know, perspective, especially the perspective of a southern country, of the periphery of, of the world economy. And uh, that's what I did in my uh, PhD during my studies in a not so friendly atmosphere, as Patrick was saying, IR is not like this. I did my uh, part of the research while I was in the BRICS Policy Center, but this was for a short period. BRICS Policy Center is maybe not uh, as SIA, it has a little bit more space for, for critical thought. Um, and I, what I did in my PhD many years ago was to uh, analyze the internationalization of Brazilian multinationals along with the Brazilian state, what was the internationalization of the Brazilian state, in which was the mechanisms that the Brazilian state has developed to promote and to protect its own capital abroad in the context of emerging economies, in the context of BRICS. And, and from this analysis, I came to theory, and I came to see what is exactly in the imperialism theory. What is exactly in this whole discussion of hegemony? Because in Latin America and South America especially, we discuss a lot about the Brazilian role as a hegemonic, uh, you know, sub uh, hegemonic power there. And uh, uh, what are the contributions that Guimaro Marini, the dependency Marxist theories, and others more uh, uh, um, actual, more current uh, theories can bring to us, such as Eugenia Spontes, the historian uh, Marxist uh, uh, professor there who has developed the concept of capital imperialism, and now what are the connections with U.S. economic empire or uh, Harvey's uh, surplus uh, um, value uh, dispossessions that, that he has theorized. So I'll bring a little bit of this. What Patrick has me to do now 
is, uh, try to summarize and explain uh, what is the fantasy theory, where that comes from, and what is the exact uh, interest that Marini has in the whole discussion of dependency and how this concept of uh, sub imperialism came about. So I try to explain without a PowerPoint, it's just uh, if you don't understand, please uh, let me know. Uh, what has to be thought before we come to the 60s and the 70s in the Latin American context, that's where this whole theory uh, arises, comes from, uh, was the first step in the 1950s with the creation of ECWAC, with the Econom Latin American Economic Commission in the UN. And the whole discussion that Raul Prebisch, the Argentinian economist, brought when he theorized about where he uh, named the uh, difference of terms of trade between Latin America and Europe, especially England. And after uh, Prebisch, uh, Celso Furtado, the Brazilian economist, and uh, Conceição Tavares, another Brazilian economist, all of them were settled in Santiago de Chile, in the uh, ECLAC headquarters, in the 50s, 60s, and after the putsch in Brazil, the military putsch in 64, they were in exile in Chile, working there, and then from there, after the putsch in Chile, elsewhere in the world. So there is this connection of the reality of military putsch and the whole Cold War context and the theorization that they brought about. Uh, interesting is to notice that uh, every those, those intellectuals, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who was the Brazilian president, Marini, others, uh, they all moved to Chile after the coup in Brazil in 64 because Chile had a socialist experience with Allende. So they went there in exile and coincidentally the ECLAC headquarters were there. So they were developing international theory from the Latin American perspective, originally, uh, you know, from the south, from the periphery, uh, looking at the world economy from this other perspective, uh, but connected with their political struggles in that period, which was the struggle against the military dictatorship and, you know, this uh, hope for another more just society that Allende uh, brought in the context of the Chilean experience of socialism after the Cuban Revolution. And when the coup d'etat in Chile came about in 1973 uh, and Pinochet you know, took power in the way that we know it, they bombed the, the, the palace in the Santiago and all this, all those Brazilian and other intellectuals, they had, of course, to move <laughs> away once more. And then uh, you can see the difference of the dependency theory developed by Cardozo, who went to Sobon and spent his time in Paris and in, in the U.S. and he was writing, you know, in the cycles, intellectual, you know, metiers and cycles of an elite, of an European elite in that period. Whereas Marini, he went to Mexico and he was set up in the UNAM, in the National University of Mexico. His whole work was written mostly, not the whole, but 80% was written in Spanish, we had to translate it to Portuguese afterwards because he was totally, from this time, connected with the Latin American context of struggle against imperialism. So very different than you know, the career that Cardozo uh, uh, followed in his you know, exile, whereas Marini was. And the main center of Marini's studies, where his whole work is, is nowadays still in Mexico, it's not in Brazil. What my colleagues in the Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil, did this year, they just opened a center of Marxist and fantasy theory in, uh, uh, with the name Vania Bambira, which is another Marxist fantasy theorist uh, who died last year. So for you to have an idea where this context uh, is situated and how these intellectuals developed their well, they all draw on the ECWAC theories of unequal uh, trade terms, which uh, was the, you know, the basis of, uh, of uh, Frebisch, Raul Frebisch is this Argentinian economist, as I said, 
in trying to confront the idea of the comparative advantages of the classical uh, uh, liberal uh, economic theory, you know, that said everyone should specialize in that everyone, you know, develops as the best and, and is less cost and then with, with less working force. And then in free trade system, everyone would gain and everyone would be, you know, happy with and satisfied with as many goods as possible for the cheapest prices. And uh, that was actually what the Latin American uh, countries followed, you know, in the, in the 19th century as, as uh, not former colonies anymore, as independent countries, but still in the colonial form of trade with the European countries. So it's for just to know that mainly, mainly all Latin American countries had their independence from the former colonial period in the 17th, uh, 18th century. 18th century maybe. So in the 19th century, uh, the, the, the relationship with the European powers, the traditional European powers in that period, was through trade and investment, and uh, they were you know, kept producing uh, raw materials, agricultural materials, mining, and selling this to you know, the external uh, world market to uh, uh, the European powers where they were buying uh, uh, products with more, uh, you know, technological uh, 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 factors. So the, generally, just to, you know, like it's more complex than this, of course, uh, but generally what uh, Pratish could prove in his studies, studying the Argentinian case precisely, is that uh, the Latin American countries were transferring value to the European countries through this world trade. You know, they were paying progressively more for technological products, whereas the, 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 the raw materials, the primary products that were being sold by Latin American countries were getting less and less and less value in the world market. So that, the, that even though the, the bourgeoisie in Latin America was very small, and they were mostly agrarian, they had to be uh, 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 subordinated to the bourgeoisies uh, in the European countries, and had, they had to keep on selling the same primary products. And as transferring value to the northern countries, they could never uh, accumulate capital uh, in South America, in their South American context. So, the advantage of uh, being specialized in primary products did not appear. So it was not proven. So what uh, they said in that time is that we need to change the situation. We need to start uh, producing and also selling to the world market more uh, industrial technological products. But how? We cannot. We don't have the technology. We don't have the machines. We don't have the know-how, the knowledge. Our workers are under um, educated. So what can we do? And that you know really influenced public policies in the 50s in Latin America. They said, well, we must induce through uh, attracting foreign direct investment. We must induce industrialization. So industrialization was you know the big uh, safe haven to come out of under development. Uh, for those uh, uh, ECLAC uh, uh, thinkers, ECLAC intellectuals. And how to do this? Well, multinational corporations would never come here and develop our countries. They would just come here and extract our minerals, our goods, and go back to the external market, to the foreign market, and go back to Europe. How to do this? Well, first, uh, we must have strong state policies. First, to attract those investments, and second, to keep them here and you know, make them somehow uh, produce also here and uh, have somehow, as a result, some accumulation of capital. The whole question was how to accumulate capital inside uh, Latin American countries and not just transfer value through trade uh, all again uh, to you. So a whole bunch of uh, economic programs were developed from that period in Brazil, in Mexico, in Argentina, uh, that uh, would substitute imports and only induce and promote exports. 
So the import substitution uh, program was kept in Brazil for about four decades. We had that until the beginning of the 1990s uh, in, the, you know, in the hope or in the struggle to try to accumulate capital inside and you know, promote capitalism for an internal bourgeois and not just be subordinated uh, through raw materials to, uh, uh, to the center of the world, to you. Uh, of course, this uh, intention did not work so well, as you know. That we did develop some industrialization, we did develop some capital accumulation, but the whole question was we did not come out of underdevelopment. We did not come out of dependency relations through uh, market to the European superpowers and then to the US after the Second World War. So uh, in the context of the military dictatorship in exile, as I said, some authors have drawn on this first uh, step that ECWA did uh, and tried to answer the question. So, why, after some industrialization, we did not uh, come out of underdevelopment? Why, after some industrialization, we could not, you know, be more autonomous, more independent from the center? And the answer, in general terms, that came out, and that is very clear, the Wunderfrank idea, is that we cannot dissociate development from underdevelopment. They are associated Whereas the center is developed, they can do this only because you know they underdevelop, they buy raw materials for undervalued, they exploit the working class in the periphery of the world economy. In the Buddha Front developed that idea that every time there is crisis in the north, crisis in the main economies, then you have a surge of industrialization in the south, as it was in the 1930s in Brazil and in other places. Uh, the, the dependency theory in general then came to this question of not only underdevelopment and how to develop capitalism in the South, how to develop capitalism in the periphery, but to the question of how to come out of dependency and then, for some, to do a revolution. Right. For others, no. The whole question of an associated development and associated dependency, that was the question of Cardozo, uh, did not necessarily you know, lead to a revolutionary solution, whereas Marini uh, was you know, very orthodox in the sense, was trying to analyze the capitalist conditions in the South, in Brazil, and Latin America, to uh, you know, point out the ways for a revolutionary outcome, a revolutionary exit. Uh, and what was the Marxist dependency theory main uh, 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 basis? First of all, they kept uh, uh, or with the idea that ECLAC has first developed of this continuous value transfer through raw materials export, through the world economy, from the periphery to, uh, to uh, the European countries. You know, the whole uh, question there was that the working class in Europe keep their salaries, their working salaries high and their uh, social rights, uh, uh, you know, basic rights kept there because the bourgeoisie in Europe could extract more value from the working class in the South and from this productive of, of, of primary products in the South. So in order to you know, keep more or less the working class in Europe, somehow <laughs> domesticized, dominated, or somehow count, uh, they could uh, you know, compensate uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, profit uh, taxes through the extraction of more surplus value from the working class in the South. From the other side, from the bourgeoisie in the South, uh, and when I say the South, I'm talking about Latin America, maybe because that's how this uh, theory sees it. Uh, they were, you know, subordinated to the bourgeoisie in the European countries. They had to transfer value. They had to keep on selling 
you know, primary products are evaluated to the mark uh, in order to keep their own production. So how would they also, from their side, compensate this and keep their profits in a higher, uh, higher as possible rate? Also, over-exploiting the working class in those countries in that region. And what is this concept of the over-exploitation of the working force that is you know, one of the basis for the Marxist dependency theory? First of all, is really work until you are exhausted. But physically, so the you know, workers working in the sugarcane plantations, working in the under conditions of mining in Peru and sugarcane plantations in Brazil. So working through really an exhausting uh, uh, situation. So, you know, this, this seems like it was later in the period, but we had in the recent period in Brazil many cases of uh, young men around their 30s uh, who died from heart attack in sugarcane plantations nowadays. The physical conditions of the working conditions are, you know, until the end of what you can extract from value from this workforce. But it's not only this. So this is one side. The other side is that the salaries, the payment that you pay for this working class, is under evaluated. It's, it's below the substance of one could live in those countries. So you must keep the salaries or what you pay for a living, as low as possible, whereas you extract everything that you can from this workforce. Well, this, in, this dependency theory uh, uh, idea would compensate you know, the bourgeoisie in the Latin American countries for this transferring of value to the North, and the Northern bourgeoisie could keep the working class you know, with a, a better uh, a condition and payment than the, bourgeois, than the working class in the South. But this has an effect. The effect was that since the masses of the people were under conditions of working in this situation, they cannot consume what they produce. So you need the external market still in order to keep on producing and in order to keep on, on, on making profit. So uh, what Marini came to you know, develop is the idea of an absence, of, a, of a, a, a failing of an internal market, when you have the separation of the sphere of circulation and of production. Whereas you have you know, your production, especially when industrialized through the terms of that class, producing some, some uh, products with a little technological value. But you have to, again, put it on an external foreign market because you cannot sell it in your own market because your masses, your working classes cannot buy it. So uh, the whole idea of you know, having like, luxury products, like, cars, for instance, like, now you have a credit system that you make people consume cars. But you know, until the 70s, the, the situation that Marini was analyzing was that even though you did industrialize to some extent, since you have the separation in the sphere of production and the sphere of, uh, of circulation, you know, you have to put these products back to the foreign market. So you still have this absence of an internal uh, market to consume because of the over-exploitation of, of labor. So this situation is unsustainable. It's, it's you know, it, 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 it can't keep on going, going on unless the working class uh, uh, starts organizing and, and, and changing the situation. But what happens and what makes it more complex? Well, Marini uh, sustains that after the Second World War, the expansion, I'm sorry, do you understand? Is that clear what I said? I don't know if I'm, <laughs> yeah, is it okay? I'll keep on going, but you ask after if you, if you feel like. Um, what Marini is analyzing is then the period from the 70s on, when, uh, you know, U.S. hegemony was well established uh, through, not only, but through the expansion of U.S. multinational corporations, 
And one of the interesting points is that uh, Latin American countries were calling for those multinational corporations to come in order to industrialize. That was the period right before that. So and not only US, but also European uh, corporations that have it. In the case of Brazil, for instance, the whole automobile industry is, is made of European uh, corporations, uh, and mainly German and Italian. Um, so you have this both sides, you know, the Latin American countries willing to, to industrialize and calling for investment, and the expansion of US multinational corporations in this phase that you know after World War II. To you know the first rec uh, reconstructing Europe in Japan and then uh, coming in some parts of production in some parts of the value chain. That's the main point, right? It's not the, the most uh, original technological one, but in just some parts of it. Marini uh, also he notices in his work how the machines and the parts of industries which came to Brazil, they were already uh, over time. They were already old for the US and European context. So they sent us debt that they didn't want to have anymore. And that's the, the, the way that we industrialized. Uh, so they were expanding. And uh, not only uh, this uh, uh, production side of the US expansion, but also the financial side. So Brazil under military dictatorship was uh, uh, attracting, uh, trying to, to get credit uh, uh, abroad uh, in order also to, to construct, and to build, and to, uh, to, uh, to industrialize uh, uh, inside. So Brazil uh, went you know, in the boat and accused to get credit from international banks, and it did, it did a lot, <laughs> and then we had this debt crisis in the 80s, but in the 70s, uh, we, after the, the, the first cycle of financial crisis in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, you know, financial capital was around the world looking for uh, uh, profit making, and Brazil was there in order to attract that uh, financial credit. And the uh, multinational corporations you know, uh, progressively uh, being installed there. So that Brazil is one of the cases, and Marine you know, tells that maybe uh, Spain is another, Israel is another, uh, which get what he says a medium organic composition of capital and comes to the space of monopoly capital and financial capital. So Brazil starts in this sort of middle tire, if you figure a, a pyramid. I mean, I, you know, I have some, I have my critics on this too, of course, because I think this is, you know, very rigid, very hard. But you know, it, it's interesting to figure this out. If you figure out the pyramid, then you have the powers that are traditional ones in the very top European, especially the U.S., and you have the bottom, and the bottom is us here. But you have a middle tire. This middle tire is the. <coughs> You know, the level of uh, capital accumulation that is not as developed as the top, but it has already reached a middle organic composition of capital enough to exploit other economies, enough to build its own multinationals, enough to have some sort of monopoly capital too, enough to have a financial market. Right? So, it cannot be, this is something important that I think that must be kept in mind. It cannot be imagined without the top, right? Without the US and without European powers operating. It's not autonomous. But it wants to be autonomous, that's the whole point. Because it has this economic side, right? This is the face. Lenin's term, the phase of monopoly of financial capital, but it's the phase of the medium organic composition of capital, but it has a political side. So the, the, the concept of sub imperialism is sometimes maybe understood through its economic aspects, but it has a very strong political aspect, which is a strong state capable of dealing with the imperial bourgeoisie in the world capable of repressing its own working class, right? And capable of dealing with its 
armed bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie in this little tire, in this little power, in this little uh, getting composition of capital, needs its own states in order also to deal with the bourgeoisie in the north. So the state and bourgeoisie relations in those, uh, uh, in those, if uh, you call, social uh, formations, uh, it's very, it's very linked, it's very tight. You cannot understand, you know, sub-imperialism without figuring, you know, a state bourgeoisie connections in subordinated and dependence conditions. That's Marini's uh, uh, term. So, this is then the role that those countries uh, end up assuming in the chain of imperialist, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, exploitation, it's imperialist accumulation, it's imperialist surplus value deposits that, you know, is exploited from the main powers. So it's a uh, uh, key part, it's dependence condition, it keeps on being exploited, it keeps on, that's very important, it keeps on transferring value to the center. It doesn't end this. It does never since Ecla. But it is, in the same time, in the condition of extracting surplus value in, from other regions, especially poor ones, especially you know, other weaker economies in the South. So the combination of these economic conditions with the political intention of having this expansionist policy going abroad, having multinational corporations exploiting others, having a bourgeoisie capable of dealing with this and having a strong state capable of repressing its working class uh, is that uh, comes to be what Marini uh, calls sub-imperialism. And that was exactly the situation in the 1970s in Brazil, uh, you know, during the oil crisis, the oil shock, the financial crisis, Brazil, you know, getting all the credit, having already a middle term in this realization, <laughs> has developed its own monopoly capital, especially in oil and the mining industry, but not only. So if you see now, I don't know if you've heard here in the news, the car wash uh, investigations in Brazil that is hitting very hard all the construction companies. These same construction companies, Odebrecht, which is very strong in Angola here in Africa, Odebrecht came to be what it is as a huge monopoly in that period articulated to the Brazilian state through the public constructions, through the public policy that the Brazilian state under military dictatorship had. And you know, other brash comes from a family in the Bahia state of Brazil. You know, it was nothing <laughs> until this time. Uh, so exactly it was, uh, you know, Brazil, well, Marini was, it was exactly this uh, situation that Brazil was living in this period. So Brazil in the 70s, then expanded first to Africa. Uh, Petrobras is the oil company went to Angola, other question to Angola, uh, and to Latin America, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, uh, and later on also Argentina, after Argentina sold out all its assets in the neoliberal uh, period. Uh, so just to finish, I think I've said too much. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Uh, what Marini uh, ends up his theory with is that uh, the sub-imperial states, they have this very ambiguous role. Because if they claim for autonomy, if they, you know, sometimes really get impatient with the main powers, they still not first question the whole framework, the whole structure that causes its dependency in the dependency theory analysis, which is the transfer of value to the uh, main economies. Uh, does the question the whole you know, framework of, of, of in which capitalism operates, in which capital accumulates, right? But at the same time, it demands uh, you know, autonomous sovereignty, uh, its own uh, expansion, its own expansion, its project, its own expansion, its intentions towards other southern regions, so that he comes to the concept that he calls the antagonistic cooperation with the main imperial powers. So it cooperates, but it tensions with them at the same time. 
it, you know, it reclaims its own autonomous policy, but at the same time is highly dependent on what the main powers do to accumulate capital in order to get into this and also gain something. So they are not totally autonomous, but at the same time they're not totally dependent as, you know, in Latin American context, you can see Honduras or, or Costa Rica, you know, or you know, our colleagues who are now still, you know, working further and developing further this uh, analysis of Marini, you know, they come to the example of Mexico, Argentina. Why do those countries, which uh, reach this uh, more or less uh, economic situation of a middle compos uh, organic composition of capital, which have their own multinationals, which also, you know, sometimes their multinationals also expand and invest abroad. Mexico, for instance, has some some important multinationals in Latin America. Why can they not be sub imperial powers? Because they don't have this political project. Because they don't have this strong state operating with its uh, bourgeoisie in an expansionist project that wants to be autonomous from the imperial powers. So in a Marini's analysis, and they you know, reproduce this to this uh, last period of Brazil under ruler, uh, Brazil kept its Brazil kept this intention of an autonomous policy as an expansion of its policies. And that's where we then entered to kind of into this in this analysis of, of Brazil, uh, Brazilian capital in Africa and in South America. South America for, for the case of Brazil, South America is the main territory of Brazil uh sort of period expansion. That's no question. When I come to Bolivia, it's uh, <laughs> it's surprising they <laughs> they keep on adding why are you so sub here? Because in Bolivia, in Paraguay, it's different than Colombia or Venezuela. In Bolivia, in Paraguay, it's really surprising, it's amazing that the intensity, the, 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 the amount of Brazilian capital, Brazilian multinationals there. Uh, but what we, me and Karina did since 2012 was to analyze uh, uh, Brazilian uh, 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 activities and performance in Africa because this was so important as a political project for the rule of law. So I can explain that a little later. I hope you understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm curious, did you learn a lot about Mauro Marini? Does anyone know about Marini's tradition? Is this the first time for all of you? Is that right? Some of, some of you, if you raise your hand, you, you know about Marini. Um, probably our closest um, intellectual comrade uh, was Sam Moyer, who used, along with his colleague, Harris Yeros, uh, Marini's theories. Uh, and there's a bridge that Sam, who tragically died in a, in a car crash in, in Delhi in November 2015, but that they bridged, because uh, Sam has a, has a doctorate in, in geography, they bridged the Marini tradition with all of this rich internal analysis with the tradition, I'll quickly run through and then update you on the empirics. Um, and that tradition is the, the tradition of the geographer um, David Harvey. Let me ask you, since Harvey is published uh, in English uh, largely and uh, Harini not, um, is this, uh, I do resync, is that correct? Resync. Resource. Reset. Resort. Resource. Source. Ah. So, source of opening, yes. yes. Um, do, do you know David Harvey's work? Certain people here are familiar with it, and you've read it carefully. I, I'm just going to do a very quick summary of why the thesis of uh, sub imperialism follows from the crisis of imperialism, which is a crisis of, of world capitalism. Finding, finding, finding. We were having these little problems a minute ago, but, but it seems to me that that process, sorry, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to show you some, some, uh, some more slides of the. Uh, uh, quite relevant to this question of why did sub-imperialism emerge, especially around uh, the big crisis of 2008, and what are the relations between those empirical observations and a general theory that at first blush does seem to be quite sort of um, consistent with this approach that we've had from the Latin American dependency theorists. And I'm thinking especially of Gunter Frank, I'll come back to the 1930s in South Africa in a minute, but the, the general question, as you see here with David Harvey's little um, 
little video that he did. I hope you'll all have a chance to pull this down. But Harvey did um, a wonderful video about the crisis of world capitalism uh, that's been seen many millions of times. And that, that DavidHarvey.org is a, a wonderful source for getting to know his work. Um, he essentially looks for the composition of capital rising. So we start from relatively labor-intensive production at the very source of surplus value in uh, labor and capital combining. But the crisis conditions on the left emerge because of a rising organic composition. So where Anna, for those of you who don't know our, our funny language, Anna was saying there's a medium composition of capital. It's where there's relatively more labor intensive compared to the imperial countries. And the imperial countries suffer from having overcapitalized. The overaccumulation leads to a series of contradictions, including overproduction of uh, manufactured goods. Um, and those flow through a full circuitry. Usually it's the financial markets that move the surplus capital. But critically, this is through space and time. Um, and the most violent moment recently was in 2008-9, when that big crash happened. And David Harvey's book, although it came, it came out before, The New Imperialism in 2003, he was already pointing that there are first observers and then producers of surplus capitals that become competitors on the world stage. So BRICS emerges really around 2007 in, in, uh, in Russia and then it takes on its final form, or the current form, in 2010 when South Africa is invited in. And this is where sub-imperialisms arose as each developing center of capital accumulation seeks out systematic spatio-temporal fixes for its own surplus capital by defining territorial spheres of influence. Shall I just take a couple of minutes to show you where that is now? What are the territorial strategies within the sub-imperial group? Because um, we actually had a conference two weeks ago in Hong Kong with the leading progressive uh, Asian activists and intellectuals. And we were very concerned not just about BRICS, but OBOR, or sometimes it's called BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Because Xi Jinping is trying to expand massively and the BRICS offer a continuation to neoliberalism, according to this conference statement, the Belt and Road Initiative, is to export China's surplus capital uh, in alliance for the mutual benefit of big foreign transnational corporations and regimes, which are often authoritarian, at the expense of working people and the ecology. You can even feel this, um, let me call it, um, desperation in the logo. This was uh, GMN. Uh, again, two weeks ago today, a big uh, summit of BRICS leaders, and at the um, sort of uh, rise of the, the Chinese desperation, they just made the hundreds of ghost cities. They invested their surpluses uh, through urbanization, through railroads, through um, new airports, ports, um, and especially these ghost cities. Uh, you were hearing Xi Jinping begin in 2015 already in the UFA BRICS to talk about the need for centripetal. So if you, can you remember back to your, your elementary physics, a centripetal force within a spinning motion tightens and links and overlaps your forces, right? Um, the bricks used to be very overlapped and interlocked. You can see now they're spinning. I think Xi Jinping's going to have to admit, and even Pepe Escobar, one of the most famous bricks promoters, did so in writing, that my challenge here uh, is that they're centrifugal, which is the opposite. It's spinning that creates chaos and, and, and kind of uh, uh, layers that aren't forging and fusing, but falling apart, right? And the, the spinning motion of a world economy out of control is creating not the overlap, the interlock, the solidity, but instead, uh, uh, these were the other BRICS logos where, where, the, where the logo, you know, uh, designers really knew bricks were, were connected. I think we're, we're seeing some, some subversion going on from somewhere in Beijing where they do their graphic design. And you can see this bricks is beginning to paper thin and, and falling apart. So here's why. Uh, it, it, obviously, it's a huge chunk of the Earth's population, 42% uh, of the world's workforce, 46% uh, of the land area. So it looked like, as Lula put it, a new economic geography has emerged. To come back to uh, the traditions we began with, uh, it could be that this isn't just the five, but there was talk from Xi Jinping of a BRICS plus this year. That was vetoed, by the way, by India for reasons that are interesting. 
But there's a whole series of semi-peripheral countries, for those of you who know the world systems theory, that could well fit into the, the logic of a, of a sort of part of the world economy that's ready to challenge the North. It turns out that BRICS comes from Jim O'Neill, who's the Goldman Sachs investment manager at the time. In the year 2001, he says, we're going to see building block BRICS of the 21st century. Um, they are pretty notorious for bubbling. I mean, if anyone knows the name Goldman Sachs, yes, they're running the US uh, economic system through the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, the economic czar. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a major institution. Here, do we, do we worry about Goldman Sachs? You know, Colin Coleman, Tito Boweni, Leslie Mausdorf. Uh, Boweni and Mausdorf were uh, deployed to be the BRICS directors. Uh, as Mouweni put it on Facebook last month, he was just fired. But, you know, the Goldman Sachs influence really is everywhere in that sort of sense. Um, at the time of crisis, when Goldman Sachs was very exposed, is quite important. So let's look what happened. This building BRICS uh, idea comes from the complete slow down collapse in some cases, in Japan's case 1990, and the overall stagnation, and I would say the over-accumulation crisis in the northern capitalist countries from the 70s onwards. So we have a long 40-year process in which this over-accumulation of capital, stemming from its core contradictions, I might add that uh, 150 years ago and three days, Das Kapital, volume one, was published in Hamburg. So happy birthday to Das Kapital. Because you'd really get from capital an explanation of how uneven development, the rise of China uh, per capita GDP, but the contradictions don't get resolved by that spatial fix. In many ways, overproduction, financialization, and now the spinning of centrifugal forces that create deglobalization are more evident than ever. So if you go back to, to Ekla, and you go back to Prebish trying to figure out how can we industrialize, it's exactly as Anna said. You need an international division of labor that gives you space. And Werner Frank said, well, the 30s was the space when the North was in crisis, even though there was a Lumpen bourgeoisie problem. You could actually see a deglobalization lead to growth. So South Africa is a clear case of this in the 30s. The deglobalization, which was what in the 30s? Do you remember? Um, Great Depression, World War II. So we couldn't bring ships in without fear of German U boats. Uh, the world financial system melted in the early 30s. Um, and so the possibility of trade finance, of foreign direct investment, um, were all much lower. And, and so we had a sort of balancing effect, which means manufacturing. So some of you, if, if you know the a sort of long strip that goes from the East Rand out to the West Rand, that uh, long strip along the main Greek road and all of the factories are 1930s era, because that's when we began to see secondary industry, not just mining equipment here in South Africa. And the rate of growth of the black wages rose dramatically in that period as labor intensive production systems kicked in. Instead of importing, the import substitution led to an overall GDP growth rate of 8% per year in the 30s. Is that something none of you have ever heard? Is that right? I'm not surprised. They really do want you not to know that you can deglobalize and do well. Um, Wall Street bankers are warning that 1930s style melts, like 2008, like 1998, uh, and in the US, 1987, are around the corner. This is a, a couple of weeks ago with HSBC, City Group, Morgan Stanley, worrying about a painful drop, a uh, melt. Global profits have picked up a little bit, but they're basically following the general tendency of overproduction, uh, um, not based on growing investments, because that's overaccumulated, but on financial bubbling. So the New York Stock Exchange, or the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, or the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange, are at their world-time highs. We are, with a guy like this, certainly worried about trade wars, about deglobalization. These are some of the processes even before Trump. We've had these experiences in the 19th in the 1880s, in the 1930s, and really since 2008. Um, McKinsey, I'm not the greatest name to mention in South Africa these days, but McKinsey does these studies of, of the uh, flows of global capital, of trade, foreign direct investment, cross-border financial assets. They're way, way down. We are in deglobalization. FDI shrinking dramatically from a peak in um, 2008 of 4% of GDP now to one6 the returns on FDI are lower and lower. This is the profit rates 
on foreign direct investment, especially the OECD. We can look at the higher rates of profit of, for example, South African corporations in the rest of Africa, then in South Africa and in the north. It's quite, it's quite revealing. It does show that they are in a desperate mode and, and going to the riskiest parts of the continent. Places like Nigeria and Angola, where they cannot get their profits back because those countries with the oil crash have run out of hard currency. They're not, you know, SAA is in a big crisis because Nigeria, Angola, Zimbabwe cannot pay the profits. They cannot return profits to, to, to German headquarters. Um, so we've got a, a decline in cross-border financial assets since 2008. World trade went way, way up. Big, big mercantile boom in the 90s and 2000s. And then since 2015, it's just been crashing. The most clear incident was probably the Baltic Dry Index. This is the declining road of control of trade in South Africa, very exposed to world markets, India, China, Russia, Brazil, all falling rates of trade as a percentage of GDP. Last year, Julian Tett from FP said, the patterns of modern trade and global growth are not behaving as the Western and emerging market financiers might have expected, as they did during earlier booms. And has anyone heard of the Baltic Dry Index? I lived for a dozen years in the Durban port. And that's really shocking. This is the 12,000 peak for the Baltic Dry Index, the main measure of world shipping, down to 300. It's recovered to about 700. But I could just feel that metabolism of shipping in a place like Durban just grinding to a halt. And one reason, what happened to commodity prices? Rising and crashing. What I'm driving at with all of this empirical material is that deglobalization is with us. If people are tired of globalization, there's a gated globe. There begins to be, like China put on major exchange controls as it hit big stock market crashes in the middle of 2015 and early 2016. And it's not surprising in a way that a Keynesian embrace of homegrown uh, import substitution, and especially let finance be primarily national, uh, an embrace of that spirit that we should be localizing. And there's a, obviously climate change reasons for localization of economies. So to globalize people, but to deglobalize capital, seems to be where even one of the, great, well, the greatest bourgeois economists of the 20th, 20th century has argued. Big business is worried about deglobalization. Others are promoting it, Walden Bellow, key intellectual, or probably our greatest African political economist has argued for many years that delinking is a sensible strategy given this overproduction, overaccumulation, overfinancialization, um, overcapacity. We could go into all the manifestations of it as we look at Africa, but very quickly, the expansion of capital is very well strategized by China with the Belt and Road. East Africa is part of it, but there are contradictions. Some of you know the Journal Monthly Review. I have an article in this current edition about those excesses where China is now having to cancel projects all over. Um, so, for example, Bagamoya, an $11 billion port, where the biggest project in world history, does anybody know? We'll talk about it after the break, but it's $100 billion. It's a dam on the Congo River, right? We'll get to the, the um, Inga hydropower project. They're obviously doing this not just because there's surplus capital to sort of push out from this overaccumulation crisis China is suffering, but also because they want to have a new geopolitical strategy to avoid the dangers of those very, very hotly contested routes. You might know there's big, big geopolitical war underway, you know, kind of tensions in the South China Sea. But particularly if you look at this one, uh, the China-Pakistan corridor, which is where the bricks nearly fell apart a couple of weeks ago. In fact, India boycotted the Belt and Road Summit in May. Modi didn't go, and they don't want any part of it. Why? Well, you know, because the India uh, a Pakistan conflict is right in the Kashmir, and that's right at that site where China wants to build a major road. They've already built a port there, right? The corridor includes projects in land belonging to India, they say, uh, in Kashmir, could push smaller countries on the road into a crushing debt cycle, like much of Africa is now facing. I think we're going to face in South Africa, too. China's agenda is unclear. And so the Indians have come up with their own strategy, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, which when Karina speaks about Japan, Brazil, becomes very important to Japanese, usually much lower profile, but potentially taking uh, the alternative strategy to, to BRICS, um, to Belt and Road. The BRICS have been rising, but now they're falling. The contradictions in world capitalism are coming to a head. To understand this, not looking at imperialism as all-powerful, 
finding its contradictions, understanding it as a site of power that in turn to reproduce requires spatio-temporal strategies. Spatio, moving the money around. Temporal usually refers to the credit system that allows you to displace your problems through time, pay uh, later, uh, repay loans, but consume now to mop up the overproduction problem. The spatio-temporal fix, David Harvey says, is also accompanied by accumulation by dispossession. Spatial is shifting. Temporal is stalling. Accumulation by dispossession is stealing. Shifting, stalling, stealing are the crisis management and displacement techniques of capital. There's no resolution until there's a crash. The guys that are managing bricks thought that bricks would be the resolution, the building bricks of the 21st century. But Goldman Sachs realized, 10 years after the grand claims were made, they should find some other acronyms to churn their investors, Mint maybe, or you know, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, Turkey. And, and, and so they actually shut down their fund. Um, the commodity price uh, measures, the overaccumulation of commodities, the overcapacity, uh, all of those are some of the dilemmas. Goldman, for example, ran the South African rand uh, in January 2016, all the way down to 17.9 rand to the dollar. Do you remember that flash crash? That was Goldman Sachs, our good friends. And it's there that I'll end by saying a sub-imperial position is to amplify the contradictions of imperialism as it goes into these crises. And we'll talk after a break about how that looks when it comes to the roles of imperialist institutions, the IMF and World Bank, and their new junior, the BRICS Development Bank. The BRICS New Development Bank, which just last month launched its Africa Regional Center here. We'll talk about that after the break. But also, um, the uh, World Trade Organization, which Xi Jinping was trying to rehabilitate. Um, and also the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Each of those three are responsible for the destruction of this continent in ways after a break we can pick up. But do you want to talk about the theory? In other words, this is the mandate, the centripetal force, bricks as a block, fitting together, tapping their potentials, co carrying out cooperation. Um, when we come back, we can also talk about the cannibalism that's the reality of a BRICS capitalism that's sub-imperial amplification rather than the next uh, imperial hegemon. Rather than anti-imperial, this is a sudden imperial situation. <laughs> Thanks. So. Yeah, should we get some feedback from people? Comments, questions, or and unless that's okay. Yeah. I want to just ask something. I'm not too sure that I have that. And you have to say your name. My name is Tabiso. Actually, I am a freelance subjector, and I do work on financial publications sometimes. Hands. Um, I want to address myself. Now, what I want to understand, putting very much in a uh, layman's language, are you saying the BRICS countries? Or what you call middle tier countries uh, in financial terms, middle tier countries that are able to exploit their weaker, um, let's say, southern neighbors, so that they they can keep on transferring what you call the surplus value to the western countries, despite all this talk of BRICS uh, now being challenged to western hegemony. Is that what you say? Could we then take three or two or three and, and that's a great question. Great question. And we'll come back to more here. So you can okay. Okay. okay, yourself and then question. And say your name. So okay. Okay. Yeah, um, hi everyone, my name is Tim. I'm Duma Master of the Library Studies here. Um, I just wanted to ask um, what is the role of the BRICS when it comes to especially African countries given what's happening in the world right now? Because I had a discussion with a few friends of mine and we reached the resolution that part of the conflict that we have here in Africa is because of the vested interest that capital has here in, in Africa. But then now, what's interesting um, going through the material that we're doing now is that somehow even South Africa has a role 
in that. So maybe what would be which is a topic after break because we, we really want to put the Africa uh, implications of all of this after we get your agreement or you have to stay low. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll use that yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. uh, thanks, uh, Comrade Patrick. Uh, I'm Ashraf with the SA Brink, the BRICS Think Tank Forum. And we work very closely on research and analysis on BRICS. Uh, I'd like to take a bit of a different uh, analysis. I think it's a robust debate, precisely because to locate and classify or describe BRICS as a sub-imperialist project is actually quite a weak argument, precisely because these BRICS nations were themselves colonized. And this is very important that if you do not locate it in economic history in the last 300 years, this notion of sub-imperialism uh, for BRICS particularly is actually quite a weak argument. It's something that uh, the new right would propose. So I think we should be very, very careful in terms of how we begin to, to analyze. Let me give you one example. Um, these nations themselves lived for uh, several hundred years uh, under imperialism. India, 200 years uh, under the Raj, South Africa, 350 years, uh, Russia under the Tsar, uh, China under the Opium Wars. These are nations that were colonized and are emerging and are beginning to locate themselves within a multipolar world order. The world order that was for 600 years under Western hegemony. So I think we need to be a bit more historical and, and factual. Also, in terms of theory, um, we can learn a lot by the colonialism of a special type thesis uh, that the SACP developed in the 60s, describing apartheid racial capitalism that can be applied to Brazil as well. So I think this is very rich theory that has been developed indigenously in South Africa. We, we can begin to apply those kind of Marxist theories uh, for Brazil, for South Africa, in better understanding where BRICS is going. Because BRICS is a reality. We're moving from a unipolar world order. Uh, so my view is a bit uh, alternative, but also quite robust. We must critique it, definitely, where there are excesses. Um, it's only five years old, six years old. Uh, still uh, very, very early to tell. Um, whether BRICS is crashing or not is growing. I mean, we have BRICS plus, 10 members, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's growing. Uh, I think we need to engage much more broader with the debate. Uh, by just being anti-BRICS, for anti-BRICS sake, I think it doesn't add any value. But definitely, the social justice components are useful. We need to broaden the debate much more, much more uh, philosophically uh, and, and realistically. But definitely, the, the thesis is an interesting one, but to only apply to BRICS, I think, is a bit uh, short. That's my view. Anybody else? Yeah. So, do you want to respond? Uh -huh. I'm going to. Okay. Hopefully, this comes up as an empirical uh, bit of material about exactly where the profits are flowing which can locate uh, the different layers of the, the world economy from the reserve bank. So it's that there. So you can go ahead on that. People can have a look at that. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry because I didn't understand your name. Tabis. Tabis. There are two processes that maybe were confused in my, in my talk that I think I have to make clear because what you understood is not exactly what I was trying to, to say. There are two processes. One is the over-exploitation of the labor force, of the working force. And this process uh, of over-exploitation of the working force, it is, in the terms of the dependency theory, a sort of compensation <coughs> of the falling rate of profit in the North and in the bourgeoisie in the South. How is that? The idea that they developed is that the working class in the north, in Europe, they got, you know, they organized, they strived, they got strong enough in order to have their rights kept and to have, uh, you know, uh, enough salary, not good enough, but maybe enough salary to live. You know, they don't live under, you know, um, conditions that we live here in the south. This uh, cost, of course, this impacted directly the rate of profit in the bourgeoisie in Europe. 
Uh, and what they you know, try to develop is that the idea that the bourgeoisie in the central countries, they need to exploit and to, and to, and to extract more surplus value from these trade uh, relations with the South. And on the opposite side, in the South, in Latin America, the bourgeoisie that keeps on transferring surplus value to the North through this unequal trade relation, through this unequal terms of trade relation, they from their side also can compensate this through the over-exploitation of the working people. So this over-exploitation of the working force has a sort of like a double uh, 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 function, a double uh, result. On the one side, to compensate the bourgeoisie, uh, the agrarian bourgeoisie, uh, and, and then the, the, the early industrialized bourgeoisie in, in, the, in the South, and at the same time, also to keep or to, to, to counterpose the falling rates of profits in the north. So I don't know if, it, if I'm clear now. So you have you know in the world economy <laughs> in the division of labor, you know, the north producing technological products with more machines, with a working force which is more uh, you know organized, earning a little bit more, having you know rights in a better living conditions and consuming, which is one important point, the working force in the north is work, is proletariat, and also consumers. Whereas in the Latin American countries, in the south, the working force were being over-exploited in order to compensate the bourgeoisie in the south and in order also to make, the stress, to, to make sense of the stress of value to the north. So they could not consume. That's the whole, you know, idea that result of it that Marini came to is that you know we have this division between what they produce and what they cannot consume in the end. So they earn less, they uh, are exhausted in their work conditions, and in the end they cannot consume uh, what they what they produce. You know. And, this is not only the internal conditions of the of the working class in the south, but it has to do with the you know world trade conditions that uh, Latin America is uh, is uh, the, 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 the the place that Latin America has occupied in the division of labor through uh, um, the world economy. What happens uh, is that as you know capitalism develops further and as you know. The Second World War, U.S. Uh, comes out as a major power, and multinational corporations from U.S. from Europe, you know, have gone all around the world. You have this whole internationalization and fragmentation of production worldwide, and you have this, uh, you know, uh, 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 willingness, this search from some Latin American countries to industrialize. So you have, you know, this uh, uh, foreign capital entering those countries and industrializing part of it, or you know, some part of the value chain, uh, you get you know, better conditions to deal and to negotiate with uh, the main powers. So first, it negotiates what? Credit in better conditions. So they keep on getting more credit, more, more finance or capital. And they, keep, they try to keep on uh, uh, the attractiveness of multinational corporations to the South. And the result of this is that in some of the social formations in some of these countries, uh, you end up having uh, some monopolies. So the condition of having monopolies, oil monopolies, mining monopolies, construction monopolies, is that somehow the internal market will be also exhausted and you need to internationalize again. You need to extract surplus value somewhere, not only internal but also external. Yes. And they don't, you know, that's the only point that I want to. They don't go only to other south regions. They go also to the north in, to, in some point. That's, for instance, the case of South African conflicts, also the Brazilian conflicts. You know, they internationalize not only to the south. The progress, for instance, went to the north to, to North America as well. But where? Do 
they extract more surplus value in other southern regions where, again, the working conditions are even worse, the state is weaker, they cannot, the, the bourgeoisie cannot negotiate as well. So there is this middle tire, this middle, the, this middle strat, this, this pyramid of world market that has this ambiguous role, you know, because it is exploited and unexploited at the same time. It is dependent on the center as much as it also depends on other weaker regions, weaker nations to exploit and to, to, to extract surplus value a little bit more. So it, it is a conjuncture. I think that to go a little bit into this question. You know, capitalism is not a sta static. Capitalism changes and our countries change and <laughs> the working class has changed. So the dynamics of capital accumulation, you know, have you know changed since the 70s, since Marini's time. This is uh, important to notice. And uh, the conditions of U.S. imperialism also. For for Ted uh, says that for you for the U.S. state, uh, it's now uh, much more difficult to to manage world capitalism with the rise of China, with the G20. It has to manage. It has to manage this whole. A, a, a crisis that began in 2008. So it's harder. There are more players if you want to, you know, talk about you know, multilateral, multipolar world. And there are more players there uh, that the U.S. Uh, has to deal with, it has to coordinate, it has to manage, it has to keep under its own <laughs> uh, uh, order. Uh, so just to go a little bit, I was going to talk about this in the next section. I agree with you. And, to a certain extent, I, different than Patrick, I never start calling big sub imperialism, but I concluded <laughs> because of the research that we've been doing and we've been seeing how they behave, how they enter into this chain of capital accumulation where they are. Not because we labor first, not because we want to give them a name, but because we see how they are within capitalism and not outside of capitalism. And that's one thing that we need to pay attention to. We are not anti-race, we are anti-capitalists. So being anti-capitalist means that we need to see the class relations, the social relations, and not only nation states playing against the others. Nation states are very important, and I agree with you, we live in a more multipolar, multipolar order. And for, you know, for uh, Africa, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting time now that they have China offering credit and they don't have to get credit from the IMF. And of course this is important. I think this is very important. But that doesn't say anything about, you know, having better living conditions. Having a working class with better living conditions in other, you know, in another condition that they are. Having better environmental justice. That's the question that we need to ask. Do BRICS does BRICS bring us a better living condition as a working class people, as, as Africans, as Latin Americans? Does BRICS bring us more environmental justice or not? So that's, you know, the end. In the end, we come to see BRICS within and not against or outside capitalism. And uh, it's been already 10 years <laughs> that we didn't see any change. Well, yeah, I could just pick up quickly because I think uh, we'll get a couple more uh, points yes. on the general terrain. Yeah. But it's exactly the politicization that we want to do. And it's so good that Ashraf, my dear comrade for some 25 years, is here to make the case which I would call, with great respect, bricks from the middle. What is the middle? Usually it entails anti imperialist rhetoric, third worlds, south south solidarity and a sense of the possible, and also a sense that this is a very young process. The Chinese think in millennial terms, and uh, we're not in financial markets that are you know, quarter by quarter returns. Those are very strong positions from bricks from the middle. And I'll oh, add one more. From below, there are some BRICS activists who've done more to save lives than anyone since the end of apartheid. And I know you, when I say their names, You'll know whom you're referring to. The Treatment Action Campaign. What do they do? They work with the Brazilian government. They work with an Indian company, CIPLA. Uh, and in the period around 15 years ago, 
They turned what was a life expectancy of 52 when we were suffering genocidal. I think that's a concrete description that scientifically has been demonstrated. Genocidal policies by Tabo All right? Yeah. Um, and reversing those, but also reversing big farmers' intellectual property by using Brazilian state examples and CIPLA's generic production capacity to bring not $10,000 per person per year, the price, but to bring 4 million South Africans and millions more across Africa and the world free antiretroviral medicines. What was that? South African activists with their international allies, a Brazilian government, a China, uh, an Indian company. Is there a better example of BRICS? We're absolutely for an anti-imperialist BRICS. Who could be against that? Is there any example of uh, more success in fighting capital, in decommodifying, deglobalizing capital? These medicines are produced here in Midrand, in Uganda, in Zimbabwe, um, and doing it with the globalization of people. I think we have a model, Ashraf, you're with me, right? No doubt that's what we're all looking for. Bricks from the left, bricks from the middle, great cases. But I think what Anna said is not just, it's an understatement. We've been watching for any evidence at all, aside from rhetoric from Jacob Zuma. Not only are we not finding that anti-capitalist, social solidaristic, ecologically responsible behavior, we're seeing the opposite. And the opposite is what we're going to talk about they're doing in Africa, but also it's the way they manipulated voting at the International Monetary Fund. Well, the IMF was supposed to be, as Brian Malefic put it, with the World Bank, the Bretton Woods institutions, the real model of imperialist control over Africa. And Brian Malefic, and okay, you all in the room have every right to reject this slide and say, oh, it's another scam, like everything the guy did. But there's a rhetoric there, which is, yeah, for it's from above, talk left, so you can walk right. We know what the loans, $5 billion, today's daily maverick gives us more details. The Brian Molefi arranged from the China Development Bank for corrupt uh, transnet rail to export 18 billion tons of coal. Is that in the National Development Fund? It's Presidential Infrastructure Coordination Commission, Strategic Integrated Project, big SIP number one, 800 billion rand. That's, that's our biggest project. That Brian Malefe was arranging a loan from the Chinese Development Bank, export of 18 billion tons of coal from Lepalale all through our friendly communities up to Richards Bay. And it's that amplification that you see when they say they're going to reform the IMF, what do they do in the voting? Does anybody know how they reform the IMF? Is anybody following that? This is their great claim, right? International finance is unfair. So what are they doing? So Praveen Gordhan was asked, well, what are you going to do about the IMF? He said, well, many African countries went through hell. He was asked, yeah, the IMF must be as proactive in developed countries as it is in developing countries. The days of the unequal treatment and the nasty treatment for developing and politeness for developed must pass. Now, he was talking about IMF policies during the 2000, uh, when was that, 11, 12. He was giving $75 billion with the other bricks to recapitalize the IMF. So who does he want the IMF to be more nasty to? Come on, do you remember? Greece, my people in Ireland where I was born, Spain, Portugal. In other words, what Praveen Gordhan, who, I'll tell you, taught me revolutionary Marxist theory in the Gandhi Ashram in 1984 in those Nick sessions, right? Clear thinking revolutionary Marxist, is now saying we'll take taxpayer money from the 99% and give it to the 1% in Washington, specifically Christine Lagarde, who took her over from Dominic Strauss-Kahn, so that they can apply the squeeze on the working and poor people of places like Greece. And you know, when you get Trevor Manuel uh, arranging a $750 billion recapitalization of the IMF, we in South Africa are very much implicated in the way the IMF revitalized after the big crisis. And he was supposed to become the chair because the prior Oh, sorry, the managing director, the prior managing director, Strauss Kahn, kept having Viagra overdoses. Okay, uh, serial rapists. So they got in another uh, IMF leader, who was also a corrupt French finance minister. And when she was convicted of corruption last December, 400 million euros in a bonsala to uh, to uh, the guy who ran um, Adidas, Bernard Tapie. 
Briggs' directors voted unanimously with the other directors to renew her contract five years. And they gave her a vote of confidence the very day she was not for corruption. I'm just saying this because the Briggs, in this case, got lots more power in the IMF. Did they change the IMF? Well, here's the new voting after the last voting restructuring, December 2015. China 37, Brazil, you spent a lot of your taxpayer money to get a bigger share. Now, who lost? Because, you know, you have 100%. So some go up, some go down, right? Who lost? Nigeria, Venezuela. They lost 41% each, Libya, Sri Lanka. So you're losing all these, what? South Africa lost 21%. So the BRICS aren't this great family. They're going to put forward a great uh, unifying um, kind of candidate. They're, uh, they're completely out of control. We are, we're in a bad situation with the BRICS IMF version. It's called a contingent reserve arrangement because we're going to need a bailout. We have $150 billion foreign debt. It's 51% of GDP. The last time we were that high was PW Guota in 1985. Do you remember anybody, older people, do not push us too far? What was that called, Tommy? The Rubicon speech, right? And we're going to need a lot. And once we borrow $3 billion from the BRICS, CRA, Contingent Reserve Arrangement. Then the CRA fine print put together by the Treasury and Reserve Bank officials who in Fort Leza designed it, say, well, we have to go back to the IMF before we're going to get the other seven billion that we have. So we think there's all sorts of alternatives. We can talk about what a BRICS from below is arguing that the BRICS from above should do. Um, the same as the WTO in Nairobi. <coughs> the WTO basically destroyed food sovereignty. Remember they just, and that was India and Brazil being drawn in with a Brazilian head of the WTO, right? Roberto Carvalho de Ashreda. Um, and as I say, the, the main thing we'll talk about in a minute is what it looks like on the ground, and for example, in the, in the climate debates, how the BRICS very conveniently arranged that in Paris, the idea of climate debt, since, since China's the number one emitter, climate debt is now prohibited in the United Nations uh, treaty language. If you have loss and damage, I don't mean the global south in Houston or Miami, which like New Orleans just gets smacked much, much harder than the, the wealthier areas the last couple of weeks. But the global south, who are victims of climate debt, are no longer allowed to sue for the liabilities of polluter pays that northern uh, emitters really deserve to be sued for. Because our BRICS were able to wipe that clause right out of the Paris Agreement. Those are the ways that multilaterally the BRICS are amplifying. So, so Ashraf, when you talk about a great uh, sweep of history of anti-colonial struggles of India, South Africa, solidarity, Brazil, I say that's ancient history given the trends we're seeing today. That's where BRICS from below and BRICS from the middle, really, my dear friend, we, we have a few conflicts to work out. Um, okay, so a couple more points here right, from, from the base. Oh, no, no, I think what we should do is have a break. But let, me, let me just say this, that um, let's, let's keep the argument unfolding and let's hear the evidence. Um, it, it might be that um, it's not sub-imperialist, this formation, uh, and particular sort of members of it. Um, and we can argue that on the evidence. It just might be it is not a second Bandung project revolutionary nationalism and third worldism and so on. Again, let's keep our eye on the evidence and, and the arguments made. Um, Anna, I mean, over, tea, or over the, the profession now, you know, we can just talk a little bit about not getting lost in the sort of part dependency perspective around Brazil. You know, I mean, Mourinho was writing in the 70s and there were particular conditions that gave rise to sort of Brazilian sub-imperialism, even if you accept his argument. Um, but things have changed also, uh, and it would be nice to talk a little bit more about that. I mean, we have a democratic state uh, rising after the, the dictatorship. But how does a democratic state um, kind of engage in policing and disciplining and so on and so on? It would be interesting to talk a bit about that. I mean, the accumulation model of the PT and how that might have changed dynamics inside Brazilian capitalism. Uh, but we don't have to do that now. But I think we should have a short break, uh, just a refresher break, and then we come back because this is where the real stuff is going to be presented to you. Okay? A short break, 10 minutes, and then we come back. It's actually arrived, so we stay. So we're now going to go into a session to kind of
kind of view and the perspective around bricks from below and the kind of understanding and critique uh, around that. And we're going to have two great presentations uh, from Anna and Karina, uh, looking at how BRICS forces are working in the African economy. Uh, there were already 
uh, being developed this popular credit so that the working class could already start consuming in the 70s uh, through mass consumption and not only being you know, over exploited and that's it. So many people are already arguing that the, the development of a financial market in Brazil was not only in the, the higher levels of companies and banks, but also already in the popular basis, you know, <laughs> creating this kind of uh, spatial temporal fix that Patrick was telling that we consume now and postpone the problem for, for later. Uh, but the whole question of the monopoly capital for those big uh, multinationals, you know, that was developed in the 70s and they were, you know, even more developed during the Lula government through a specific line of credit to investment abroad. I, I wasn't going to this, but I, that's what, exactly what I, I was doing. I was mapping out the, 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 the mechanisms of the BNDS, the Brazilian uh, National Development Bank, uh, to promote and protect Brazilian investment abroad and Brazilian export. So you know, they were really, you know, pumped more. They, they, they really got much, much bigger through uh, the Brazil, uh, uh, through the Lula years with uh, Brazilian credit, state credit, public money. <laughs> um, but this money was directed to uh, international projects. So the, if you, it, it's, it's the, <coughs> the most contradictory situation that you go through Brazil and you see people living without uh, the most basic infrastructure, such as sanitary, such as you know, streets, such as you know, uh, garbage. Uh, the basic, the, the infrastructure that serves the people. But you see Brazilian exporting infrastructure uh, services, building roads and ports elsewhere, such as in Latin America and Africa. You see people uh, still having problems in, in eating. You see, even though it's less worse than it used to be, now it has gone worse again. Uh, but people don't eat uh, meat every day. But you do have a main monopoly of meat in Brazil. Uh, it's producing meat in the US. So this is what we're talking about. When it's called dependency, and you see this, this condition. We see the condition of the working people. You know, and we are at the same time with the same government, which of course improved uh, social policies, of course improved the living conditions of the poorest in Brazil. Uh, promoted, for instance, uh, um, uh, access to university for, for, for poor families. I, you know, I have a result of it, my, my place at university where I teach is a result of the such policies. The same government <laughs> was the one uh, promoting this expansion of, of multinationals in this term. You know, even though they were constructing uh, public houses uh, for the poor, they were building big roads against indigenous in, in Bolivia or they are displacing uh, communities and peasants uh, in Mozambique. So that's the contradiction of the Lula government that we still need, I think, years to, to decipher and to analyze. And not to mention the coup d'etat that we lived last year, not to mention where we are now. <laughs> I came, I was talking to Petra, I refused to talk about Brazil because it's so terrible, it's so depressing that we cannot even explain why we're not rising up against uh, this totally illegitimate uh, government that we have now. Uh, maybe we can uh, talk further afterwards. I will try to not to talk too much now that we have more time to, to, to debate. Uh, this is a research agenda that's not finalized. That's what I've been working in the last two years. I'm calling this political economy of South-South relations. I'm studying the um, investment treaties, the you know, juridical protection mechanisms that we so well know. You know, South Africa is one of the countries which has made you know, bits with many European countries and has bits with other countries. But for the case of Brazil, Brazil was never part of it. Never, never, never until two years ago. <laughs> yeah, Brazil has never signed any bid, has never had any bid with any uh, European or the US. And uh, Brazil has developed its own model of investment protection agreement. 
to protect Brazilian multinationals, starting with Mozambique and Angola two years ago. That's why I came to this research agenda and I was going to look at the BRICS and how the BRICS behave in this region. So I'm just, well, sorry, this is the only slide in Portuguese, I guess. Um, just starting very quickly to you know, situate the BRICS. This is the year of the financial crisis. This is the year where you see this uh, more multipolar world that you were talking about, you know, the distribution of production of, of productive capital, the distribution of the GDP uh, was more or less, uh, you know, more or less balanced. The U.S. losing a little bit, the BRICS together accumulating in that year, now it's much less, uh, almost 30% of the GDP in the world, and then you have Japan and Europe, and then the rest. And then this is the picture, if you want to mention history of how to, we came to this, but the picture in the year of the crisis. And that's why the BRICS, you know, woke this question of, you know, would they, especially China, would it be the next, you know, power pole in the world? Is the U.S. hegemony falling, declining towards China or the BRICS? This is um, another, sorry, this is also in Portuguese. I couldn't change it. This is a source of the Brazilian uh, industry uh, council, so the, the Brazilian companies did this research. The first line is, you know, the direct uh, uh, investments uh, from, you know, developed countries. They were up, you know, the, the, the Caesar was very high down there in the 1990s, one very up, one very high, and you see along the 2000s a sort of slight convergence between foreign direct investment from north and from the south, and you see Brazil very down there, but the light blue one is uh, developing countries in general, the dark blue one is developed countries, and you see along the, the decade of the 2000s how foreign direct investment was sort of converging with more international corporations from uh, developing economies, and uh, multinational corporations from the developed world uh, falling uh, a little bit. And this is the last one. Uh, these are the uh, uh, developing economies that were mentioned there. This comes from the World Investment Report in 2015. So you see which countries uh, are the ones who are emitting foreign direct investment, giving foreign direct investment. And you see China there, the blue one above everyone else. You see Russia down and up, down and up, but still in the second place, and then all the others a little bit down there. Brazil is like some, some <laughs> years, especially in 2006, I mean, the middle of the Lula mandate of 10 years, uh, you have an you know, upward uh, curve saying that the Brazilian multinationals were expanding abroad, but then you slow down in 2014, you have almost down from everyone else. This is a general picture of, of the BRICS. I just want to call you, I'm not going into this, uh, just to call the attention that you know, what happens beyond BRICS, outside of BRICS itself. First is the G20, so BRICS had its first summit after the G20 summit in 2009 in the context of the financial crisis. The summit was called by Russia. That's where this whole discussion of BRICS really started to call the attention and BRICS started to be more or less a political group and not only an economic group for, for the financial market. Uh, but before this, there were other things. BRICS, uh, uh, BRICS countries were meeting uh, bilaterally or trilaterally, for instance, Brazil, India, and South Africa built the IPSA, uh, IPSA. Uh, uh, so, um, <coughs> BRICS countries would meet uh, on the side of the General Assembly, the UN, but the crisis is really the moment when this starts to be important and the whole question of US decline and China come about. But what happens then uh, as side stories of the BRICS summits that then started to happen every year that caught my attention and I'm trying to follow this a little closer. First, the first BRICS business forum happened right after the, the second business, uh, uh, BRICS summit in Brasilia. And this is really important because they started to meet every year since then, until today. 
you have about almost 900 multinational corporations from the BRICS meeting one day before the BRICS summit, every BRICS summit in every year. And in the middle, in the middle side, in the, in the, in the middle uh, period of it, they had two, I don't know if now they had three, but they had two special uh, documents that they project what they want uh, from the BRICS, what they want from the BRICS uh, 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 heads of states, what they want from the BRICS in general. So they had projections, so from 2013 to 2014, and then the years later, and they uh, uh, built this business council, so it's not the forum, but the council uh, in the, the southern the South Africa, and they do put uh, concrete demands towards the BRICS to the governments. They are very interested in the BRICS. They don't think the BRICS doesn't exist. They don't think the BRICS doesn't mean anything. The BRICS is important. The BRICS bank is important for them. In the first document, 2013 and 14, Africa was very important. They even mentioned the uh, creation of a council, of a business council, BRICS Africa. Uh, the mining sector is very important, but now energy sector, agribusiness, and in the last year in, this, in Xiamen, in China, the, the, this year, that last month, uh, this BRICS business farm, they mentioned the blue economy. So now they're interested in water, in the oceans, in the marine side. So they have discussed this, and uh, this is something that we need to follow. On the opposite side is the BRICS from below me, that's not here, but you, you're very important in this, because after their I must say, and Patrick can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the meetings of BRICS from below were never so big as we did here. So we have a big responsibility next year. We did one in Fortaleza in 2014, which is not as big and not as, 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 as critical. Ufa, there was none, just the civil BRICS that was called by the Russian government. Goa, there was a small one. Well, actually, this year. Correction. Uh, Go ahead. Testimonial from Trevor, it's wonderful, the 700 people. No, no, Goa, Goa was, but yeah. just correct me if Durba wasn't bigger. I think Durba was bigger than Goa, and right? Durba. Yeah, that's, that's only the, the only point that I think. I think that you guys here <laughs> are important in pushing this, this from below. Uh, and now Patrick was in Hong Kong uh, for, for this year's summit. Um, I used normally to tell uh, that we have many uh, 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 ways methodologically to deal with the BRICS. You can look at the BRICS as, uh, you know, uh, as a structure in the world system as, as nation states, and then you really see the tensions with, uh, 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 with the traditional powers. You see them trying to accumulate power and try to rise as, 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 you know, rising powers. But you can also approach and see the BRICS uh, more horizontally and see the relations between them, and then you can see how China really weights much more than the others. How China dominates, for instance, trade between them, how all the other BRICs are totally dependent to, on the trade to China, and especially commodity trade to China, whereas China uh, trades much more uh, manufacturing products than the others. You can also see, you know, beyond uh, uh, the BRICs, uh, uh, those uh, actors such as multinational corporations, such as think tanks, as, as you said. And you can see the BRICS more vertically uh, in the sense of, of class relations, social relations, and also in the sense of uh, 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 nation states and countries and regions that are a little uh, economically weaker than those emerging powers. And then you have different answers. None of these approaches are wrong. I must I'm not saying that you know, look at the BRICS uh, generally as nation states. I think it's very important. But uh, I think it's just insufficient. I think we need to look further. And that's why I, I put it this in red. There are other actors, there are other things happening. Uh, in 2014, there was the, the creation of the uh, BRICS Bank and the mechanisms of, of, uh, that is of payment credit, that's the CRA. Uh, and this, you know, goes until uh, now. So the questions that I normally pose to myself and that I just like to discuss is this, do we see BRICS as a counter-hegemonic alternative? Or do we deal with South-South relations? This term, I don't know if it's familiar to you, because in Brazil, it started to be very familiar, because the Lula governments really, really started to, you know, have 
much closer relations to South America and to Africa than any other government before. So the term South-South relations became like a fashion you know, among academics, among the NGOs, among the social movements, and largely uh, seen as you know, more horizontal relations, more solidarity relations. Uh, but uh, can we see this also as, as power relations? Uh, that's the question that I normally ask and, and how to theorize about that. One of them could be some imperialism, but is it enough? There are others. So how to deal with it? Um, what we can see maybe in general terms is that the uh, presence of BRICS countries individually, because that's interesting too. So BRICS countries, they do connect and they do try to convert in multilateral arenas, such as the G20, such as sometimes the UN, uh, such as uh, the IMF or the WTO, they do try to convert. But when they come to explore Latin America or Africa, they act alone as individual countries. So you don't see you know, a project that is made by China and Brazil. You don't see that. Or China and, or, or Brazil and South Africa. In Latin, you don't see that. Or they connect with the traditional power. So you see Brazil acting in, for instance, in Mozambique, either with USAID or with China, the Japanese agency. So this is interesting also to see how when they are dealing with other South regions, that they do not act as you know a coherent group trying to you know build the road in that sense together. Uh, except that for, uh, let's see, in Asia, what's going to happen if they are <laughs> going to fight more than that convert or if there's any other possibility. So mainly you don't see common projects between these countries, at least in those uh, two regions that I've started to analyze. So the research agenda that I'm not, of course, been able to present this in details, but the research agenda that I've started two years ago is to try to investigate how the BRICS, since the, given, given the growth of BRICS multinational corporations, given the rise of further investment from the BRICS, how do the BRICS behave in, under the international uh, investment regime, under the international law, uh, uh, under those agreements, uh, under those uh, yeah, uh, protection investment agreements? Do they present any alternatives in that? Do they not present any alternatives in that? And you from South Africa know more, but much better than me uh, how South Africa behaves in that sense. And are there any conflicts that we see in the ISIC, SID, in the World uh, uh, Bank Arbitrage uh, the Forum? Are, are there any conflicts, any, any, any conflicts between Greece multinational corporations and uh, African or Latin American countries, so I looked at and tried to find things, you know, those critics that we normally see for the BITS agenda with the North. This is the general overview as well. You see, you know, the BITS uh, bilateral investment treaty is growing significantly in the 1990s, and then in the 2000s, you see the growth of uh, arbitration between investor and states in the ICSID uh, uh, forum in the World Bank. Uh, as I said to you, Brazil was never part of it, but the other Greeks, yes. Um, and for my surprise, I didn't know that since I started this research, China is the number two in the world <laughs> having bilateral investment treaties. Bilateral, not multilateral, not, but the bilateral plus the whole free trade agenda that China has. Because China has free trade agreements with many, uh, with many countries in South America, existing. but I didn't know that China was so fast in, in, in finishing bilateral investment treaty with so many countries, uh, losing just for Germany, you know, above and many of the traditional powers that we see here in this number 10. Uh, we have a few bits between the BRICS, but besides Brazil, every other uh, uh, here, Brazil uh, is within the Mercosul, which is the uh, common uh, 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 integration in South America. It's the, the common body. Uh, has a preferential trade agreement with India that has a clause on investment, but it's not a bit itself. 
so this is the overview of the bi investment, bilateral investment agreements of the BRICS in Africa. You see that China covers almost the whole continent, followed by South Africa. Then India, Russia, and Brazil started this uh, two years ago with this new uh, model. Uh, I'm not going to into many details as, as it is shown in this map. This is just, you know, there is a, a, a article that you got, but there is a, a more uh, complete study that I did with uh, a few of my students uh, within the work of, of PAX, of the small NGO in Brazil, uh, that you can, you know, receive, I can send to you for email. But this is the map of, of Africa and uh, the Chinese uh, uh, performance, how we say that, the Chinese investment in Africa in terms of uh, volume, and this volume is pretty updated, but that's what I got from Unstat. Unstat has updated, uh, not updated uh, uh, its, its numbers. Uh, in terms of uh, main companies and in terms of uh, sectors. What I found out, just to be quick, first, uh, Chinese uh, uh, bilateral investment treaties follow the same model as the US and European treaties in Africa. With very few exceptions, the Chinese, they are more adequate, more adapted to the Western model of bilateral investment treaties than other, even the other. They may, may have, most of them, yes, but as you know, South Africa did a small reform in 2013, India did as well, Brazil has a new model, but China, no, China really uh, went and <laughs> jumped into it, uh, the international investment regime. China is also the only BRICS which is a member state of the ICSID, which is this forum in the World Bank which accepts investors to suit a state and take it to the international court. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, discussion, because in Brazil no one is but I assume it's in South Africa, <laughs> should be familiar. Uh, China is the only ICSID member state among the BRICS. Russia wants, or Russia signed, wants to be, but didn't ratify, and the other BRICS uh, are not. Um, in just in very general terms, uh, you know, Africa uh, is the main trading partner with China. China, is, is, uh, China has suppressed the EU in terms of trade uh, with Africa, in terms of investment has suppressed the, the U.S. and many others. Um, China uh, comes to Africa mostly with a package already you know, pr proposed of investment aid and credit. So China has never come just with one of these arms, just credit or just aid or just aid. Normally, China comes with three of them together, so it gives a hospital role and gives credit to something else. Um, and its presence in Africa is, is very, very big, as you maybe notice in the streets or, or else. China has a specific fund for funding uh, African projects. Um, one also important characteristic of the Chinese investment in Africa that is different than the other BRICS is that Although it, uh, big multinational corporations of China are coming here, especially in minerals, oils, and other banks, uh, and mainly state-owned companies, uh, China's uh, uh, foreign direct investment in Africa is not uh, uh, reduced to it. It's very widespread. There are many small and medium companies uh, from China operating in Africa, so that uh, even the Chinese government doesn't even you know, follow it as it does with the bigger ones, with, with bigger threat. This is different in other uh, rich countries. Other rich countries may come in with big multinational corporations, some of them state-owned, some of them not, uh, but that's not the case of the Chinese. So I think that China is much more you know, uh, widespread and has uh, it's much more, you know, uh, 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 it will be harder, let's say, <laughs> for the Western powers to displace China and Africa the way China is already established, uh, I think, here. Whereas Brazil, for this is much, much different. Than it. There are many conflicts, notice that they're smaller to big, there are environmental conflicts, there are many labor conflicts, very uh, uh, famous ones, such as in Zambia. There are very big credits given 
uh, by Africa, uh, by, by, by China to Africa. But in terms of the ICSID, uh, we did found uh, we did find two cases with Tanzania. So not so that's the interesting part, right? So China has many uh, bilateral investment treaties, but doesn't have many uh, 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 conflicts in terms of arbitration in, in the SCSID, the SICSID. Uh, these two cases are you know, concerning uh, the electricity uh, company, which is a state of company in Tanzania. Uh, but <laughs> that's the sub imperial part of it. The cases were started by Standard Bank. And Standard Bank is based in Hong Kong and it's an English bank, it's not even a Chinese, but it used the bits of China with Tanzania in order to start uh, um, the case in the World Bank Forum. Uh, so this is uh, what we so far uh, found. But I think this map gives you a general overview of the presence of China in Africa in terms of, of sectors uh, multinational corporations and, and uh, investment treaties. And this is the South Africa uh, map. So you see, you know, it's very, it's much less. It's, it's very different. Even though it's the second, you see the Mauritius Islands as a tax haven with a lot of investment, but you know, it's not a productive investment. This is financial sector uh, from the Mauritius Islands. Many companies operate in the rest of Africa, so they use their, their subsidiaries there in the Mauritius Islands to, to invest further, and they use the Mauritius Islands also as a base for bilateral investment treaties, so they have students, for instance, not from South Africa, but for instance, India. But you see the South African, you know, Af South Africa, I'm not going to talk to you about your own country, of course, uh, but came to BRICS in 2011 as a sort of a gateway uh, from the BRICS uh, to Africa, and of course, is the largest receiver of foreign direct investment in Africa, and in its own region, is the one of the main uh, uh, investors, mainly in uh, retail, telecommunications, as you know, but also in mining, in part in manufacturing. Uh, the model that South Africa has been using has been the traditional one. Uh, except for this uh, little reform that you did here uh, after in this case uh, against an Italian the Luxembourg company because of the Black Empowerment Program. I don't know if you uh, need to talk about it. It's something that you probably know much better than I. The result is, uh, for the case of South Africa, as well as for India, is that the reforms that they are doing uh, and the critiques that they have towards the bilateral investment treaties is that having a treaty doesn't necessarily mean that you receive more investment. Many countries have no bilateral investment treaties and are the main receivers of foreign direct investment. That's the case, for instance, of Brazil. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, those investment treaties, they do bind it too much in terms of, for, uh, of, of public policies. They do into a flat space and they put you with more vulnerability uh, towards multinational corporations in the sense that uh, multinational corporations can suit you in an international forum. Uh, so what South Africa and Inter did in the small reforms you know, try to give more space to the national forums before taking uh, uh, South Africa to, to the international forum. But as Patrick uh, rightly puts, on the other hand, you know, South African other laws have, you know, guaranteed uh, 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 the interest and, and, and the protection to, to foreign and direct investment. And this is the same that Brazil did. So Brazil, uh, in the 1990s, did not sign any bilateral investment treaty, but changed its national laws in order to guarantee all the conditions to protection of foreign direct investment without having a treaty, so without being vulnerable of a multinational corporation suiting you as a country in an international forum. So I think that may be the tendency that uh, South Africa and India will uh, search in the next period. Um, in terms of uh, conflicts, there are many that are being important in terms of energy and also mining. Uh, you have this big uh, uh, case in a uh, 
well, with Mozambique is, is, is very important. It's, it's a case of, of some imperialism of Camorra Massa. But uh, on the other hand, South Africa is also an example for us in elsewhere, but in Africa too, uh, of a country which protests, which has a social organization, which has a new uh, uh, big trade union from the left. So uh, uh, I think that in terms of things from the law and protests and, and struggles, South Africa uh, gives an example of how to do uh, resistance maybe better uh, <coughs> than others. Uh, that's India. You see again, the, the tax haven't played its role in terms of receiving foreign direct investment that we uh, invest in somewhere else. Um, here, for the Indian case, Again, right, uncut numbers weren't updated enough, but I decided to work with them uh, just to have a, a, a basis uh, for, for it. So India is number three in terms of uh, bilateral investment treaties in Africa. Uh, India, again, also follows the traditional model uh, of, of, of bilateral investment treaties with all the tools, that is, you know, national treatment to, to international investors, most favored nations, investors to state uh, arbitration clause, but India doesn't uh, foresee necessarily the ICSID. India has other forums as well that can be decided ad hoc. And we've seen in those treaties which foresee the SC, ICSID as a forum, we see three cases. Uh, of multinational corporations that used their bases in the Mauritius Islands to suit the Indian state. Uh, um, that's the case of Bestel and the case of GE for uh, you know some of the policies that India did in, in terms of, of energy. Uh, and there's an Indian, that's the previous case, an Indian corporation that used its subsidiary in the Mauritius Islands to suit the Indian state as well. Um, I think the, the area was, the, I think also uh, energy, and a company from Dubai that also uses subsidiary there to suit uh, India uh, through its bids. Um, India did also a small reform in the same sense that I said, uh, try to give more space to the national years of juridical uh, uh, arbitration before uh, going out with the case. Um, well, India's presence in Africa is, is very old, as you probably know. India has a very fruitful uh, presence here, not only investment, but also cultural presence in the diaspora here, you probably uh, know. But India has a specific mechanisms also to promote its own companies here in Africa, the Indian Africa Forum, Team 9, Focus in Africa, the credit line specifically that the Exit Bank in India has for Indian companies to invest in Africa. And you see, you know, many big groups uh, from India here, you know, in many different uh, uh, areas, pharmaceutical groups, the Tata Group, everywhere, um, oil companies, Jindal, mining, and all of this. Uh, some of the Indian uh, um, analyzers of these relations, they say that the Indian-African relations, they recall the colonial period because India sells manufacturing products, uh, software, pharmaceutical products, and Africa sells all the agricultural products. But India has a specific case that uh, we want to study a little bit more, that's Karina's topic, which is uh, land. India is buying land all over we saw this number, 70% of the Ethiopian land sold was bought by Indian investors. So India is getting very you know, hard in the agriculture uh, sector and land grabbing, which is of course very uh, problematic, as we know. Um, to go more quickly, this is Russia. Of course, Russia, again, very old relations from the Soviet period. Uh, Russia, after it opened its economy after the Soviet period in the 1990s, liberalized its economy very, very fast, and then entered into this uh, whole investment protection regime with many bilateral investment treaties, even though the first bilateral investment treaties that Russia had 
date from the Soviet Union during the end of the 1980s, <coughs> uh, which is also something interesting. Russia in the 1990s, uh, under uh, Yeltsin, wanted to be part of the ICSID, but never ratified it. Um, you know, it maintains very close uh, relationships that you know, date from the Soviet time, the anti colonial struggles, the anti struggles, as you know, many uh, diplomatic representations, as you know. But uh, Russia has also two specific uh, things that are important, that are important to mention. First, its role in the uh, oil and gas sector. So, Russian multinational corporations are, and also state owned corporations, are strong in infrastructure and mining in Africa, uh, of course, with many displacements and conflicts and environmental problems. And Russia has a big share in arms trade. So, the whole trade is, you know, uh, that has its roots again in the Cold War period. But the supply of arms and military technology from the Russians to Africa is something that we need to, to, to notice and to move on to. So with Libya, with Algeria, with Ethiopia, uh, there's a big, you know, almost you know, 2011, the number that I have here, 66 billion dollars of uh, trade between Russia and Africa in terms of arms and military technology. Uh, there are many confrontations and, and conflicts in Zimbabwe, in the Fatima, in the Diamond uh, uh, Mining, um, that we can see a little bit. I'm going to go to concentrate in Brazil. It seems that Brazil is not present in Africa at all. And when I see this other map here, this is mainly the construction companies, Petrobras, uh, which is the oil uh, company, and Vale, which is the big mining company. Um, this is the uh, number of uh, uh, investment agreements that Brazil has. I say not big, but investment agreements because uh, Brazil has developed this new model. It's starting the first country that Brazil started uh, this new model, which is called the agreement that to facilitate cooperation and investment. So Brazil puts in one uh, juridical framework aid and investment together was with uh, Mozambique, Angola, and then Malawi. And Malawi uh, represents really uh, nothing for Brazil. There is no big Brazilian investment in Malawi. So why should the Brazilian state start an investment agreement with Malawi? Well, just because of this here. <laughs> That's the railway from Bari that goes from Pete in the north of Mozambique. It has to cross the Malawi to reach Nakala and export from Nakala ports to uh, China. They're taking the coal from Mozambique and this whole chain of extraction to until uh, China. So Brazil is the Brazilian state represented Bali's interest, you know affirming the state capital relation in the case of, of Mozambique uh, and Malawi. Well, the main characteristics of this new agreement, and we need to pay attention to it because it's going to be the next uh, you know, uh, framework from which Brazil will deal with uh, many countries now, um, has, uh, well, one side, it reproduces the WTO rules. So national treatment, international investor, most uh, favored nations, intellectual property rights, it reproduces the same. But it has a big difference from the traditional bits. It doesn't foresee an investor to state clause. So no Brazilian company could suit a national state or African state abroad. What it sees is a sort of a, a political governance a solution mechanism that has two focal points. So there is a common committee between both countries, and two focal points. In Brazil, is the Chamber of Commerce, and in the African countries, each one has its own. Um, and it should be a body that would try to prevent conflicts. So, prevent conflicts after the conflict is already made. In the case of Mozambique or, or, or Angola, for the case of Vale. Uh, but for the further uh, investments, it should negotiate, including the participation of the Brazilian private sector that is interested in and other 
this is civil society uh, stakeholders. We don't know how the African countries are going to deal with that because it's just time, we don't know how it's going to function. Uh, if uh, the focal points don't come to the government, those don't come to, to an agreement and they you know, report this to the joint committee, uh, there is no solution, then they need to find a, a court to arbitrate uh, on the case. As I was telling you, Brazil uh, showed more interest and really increased its uh, investments and increased its trades to Africa. Uh, in the 2000s, it doesn't start that. It starts in the military dictatorship in the 1970s, especially in Angola. Uh, but it really, it really potentializes this under ruler and, and through the mechanisms of the Brazilian uh, uh, development bank, like the BNDS. Uh, another interesting uh, part of this new uh, Brazilian model is that it has a clause on uh, corporate social responsibility. I think it's the new, will be the new fashion for bilateral investment treaties now. Um, this model includes uh, corporate uh, 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 social responsibility, but not as a binding law of the treaty. Just to, you know, as best efforts as the global compact thing. So it's the company should do all they can for uh, you know best uh, practices in terms of labor, environment, and human rights. The case is that uh, Brazil uh, started to improve and to, to increase its trade and its investment to Africa uh, through specific uh, and important uh, states mechanisms after Google. Uh, one of them is the BNDS, which is the main one. The, but there are many others, such as the, what Brazilians call Cooperation for Development. Brazil started to be a donor. Brazil is not anymore a receiver of, of, of aid. And it has, uh, you know, as its main target, again, uh, Mozambique. Uh, Brazil has representations in many of these countries. Lula opened embassies, and diplomatic representations in many of them. Uh, other instances of the Brazilian state we started to internationalize to Africa, such as the agricultural Brazilian company in Rapa, such as the uh, health is, uh, research institution called Fio Cruz. So it's not only the private companies, but these other bodies of the Brazilian state and the BNDS itself, which opened the uh, affiliate here in Johannesburg. If you can go there and see where it is. So we have many, many sorts of, of, of internationalization of the Brazilian actors uh, in the last uh, 15 years. The case of conflict, uh, you can say there are many, but the main case is in this specific region here. In this specific region, there are two big Brazilian projects. One of them is the mining, coal mining uh, project of Vale, in fact, and the whole infrastructure that Valley had to build to export the huge volume of coal uh, from this region. Now, now, nowadays, it still imports, I think, uh, from Beta, from the south of Mozambique, but it should be exporting very soon. It has already started from Nakala, and Nakala has built a private port of Valley, an airport, uh, and, and uh, a public private other port. There are two ports of Valley there. But, Besides the investment of this big mining company called Vale, there is this uh, cooperation program in agriculture that Karina will talk about. That's the zone that is this thing here, which is uh, the Pro Savannah program with Japan. Uh, Pro Savannah uh, is supposed to introduce uh, the agribusiness of soybeans and, and maybe also uh, corn in this area. So this is. The situation that we have there, that's the railway, that's uh, uh, families, and this is started with displaced families, 1,300 families were displaced from the mining uh, area where Valley wanted to, to act, and they were uh, replaced in those uh, terrible houses with many problems where they cannot do their culture. They're in this very poor and, and precarious <coughs> situation. This is uh, uh, Angola, the huge presence of Odebrecht. Odebrecht is present in Angola since uh, the 1970s and 80s. 
uh, especially to build this huge electricity dam in Kampanga. But after this, Odebrecht stayed in Angola and is in many, many different uh, areas, from recycling to sanitation to building to insurance to, you know, when we were there, we heard from the Angolas that uh, other, the Emil Odebrecht, the, the, the president of the Odebrecht, when he comes to Angola, he's received as president of, you know, his presidential things. Better than Dilma, better than the Lula would be. Uh, now, Odebrecht is investing in agribusiness in Mozambique, in Angola, with this huge uh, agri-industrial hub that they want to build also in Kampanda uh, with gas extraction and others. And it has another company, built another company there in Malaysia, which is called Biocom, also to invest in agribusiness. And last year they found a slavery similar situation in workers. Uh, in this uh, biocon there in, in Angola. You see here the huge presence of the Chinese also. So, to, so these are the both uh, publications that we have of Brazil and Greece in Africa. Uh, I'm not going to this because I don't have enough uh, 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 contents to tell, but this is uh, the same, I, I've tried to replicate the same questions to Latin America. So just a general overview. This is China in Latin America, so you see here the free trade agreements in yellow and the bilateral investment treaties in red. This is Brazil. The ACFI is this new model that I was telling you. And Brazil has developed a protocol within the Mercosur uh, in the same model as this ACFI to promote Brazilian companies within the Mercosur. This is Russia. Russia has investment treaties with Venezuela and Argentina. This is India with Colombia, or oh, Mexico up there is wrong, uh, Argentina, Uruguay. Uh, this is South Africa, I don't know if you know that. South Africa has investment treaties of Argentina, Chile, and the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, just for having a comparison, I saw Germany, Germany, and the US. They also, well, Germany is like almost everywhere. And the U.S. is in Latin America very, very strong. And this is Africa. These are Germany's uh, bilateral investment treaties that cover fully Africa. This is the U.S. treaty. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because Germany is really it's colonial. This is the colonial power, right? If we are some imperial, they are the real imperialists. <laughs> and, and well, I have an explanation why the U.S. doesn't really bother to have bilateral investment treaties in Africa, but can tell uh, this later. So just uh, to, to start finalizing my my presentation on BRICS, well, my general conclusion is that the BRICS, they follow the traditional uh, uh, powers uh, model of investment protection, so they reinforce what we call the new Lex Mercatorium, which gives uh, uh, juridical power and, and the rights to multinational corporations against human rights, against the rights of the working people or the environment. Whereas China really fits into the traditional standards, whereas the other BRICs are being more, a little bit more flexible uh, uh, than, than China in this. But the case of Brazil for me uh, uh, um, finalizes the whole phase of the Lula government when uh, the government of Brazil really represented private interests of Brazilian companies as national interests. This is now a consolidated this new model, because this new model really represents a corporation aid and investment all in one, and really operates as the state defending and having to deal with problems and conflicts that the Brazilian multinationals cause abroad. So if it's, no, in my perspective, if it's very positive in this new Brazilian model that it doesn't foresee that the multinational corporations could suit the state abroad, on the other hand, it can really consolidates the role that the Brazilian state has been having in representing private interests as its own interests. So Brazil, as a state, we have to deal with the burden of conflicts that the Vale or other press causes abroad or other conflict causes abroad. It's the, the Brazilian state which will have to negotiate uh, in the name of those private companies. 
uh, and it's now very much consolidated. Uh, I'm not going to this theoretical framework we did already. I work also a little bit with Panic and Gilly in their analysis of the American Reform Empire and how the Greek states, and especially the Chinese state, uh, rose within uh, uh, this informal empire, guaranteeing, promoting, and, and structuring uh, its own uh, state for capital accumulation, being its own capital, Chinese capital, or foreign capital within its own territories and outside of it. Um, so, just to conclude, well, I think that the Greeks end up reproducing South-South relations as power relations and not so much as solidarity and horizontal relations. Uh, in the case of Africa specifically, uh, but also in Latin America, the Greeks end up responding to this imperial competition in the search of natural resources, in search of market, in search of cheap labor, uh, putting Africa again, you know, in the target of, of imperial competition worldwide. So what you call here the new scramble for Africa. Uh, but we can say the roots, the plenary roots in Latin America are also being opened. And especially in the case of China, in oil and mining, it's something really like worth studying further and, 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 and denouncing the way they're doing this in Peru, the way they're doing this in Venezuela, and in the case of, of, of oil. The way they're doing this uh, in, in other uh, mining uh, uh, countries in Latin America. In the case of Brazil, China is very much present in, uh, in the energy and in the energy sectors in general. So, where I sustain, as I said here before, you know, the rise of the Greeks uh, is to be understood within uh, capitalism and not as an exit to it, and that's why. I'm still being very pretty. Uh, but they are ambiguous. They are not you know, clear just like this. They, are, you know, they, they search for autonomy. They search for sovereignty. Uh, they search for an autonomous space. But they behave when it comes to other sovereign regions as uh, imperialists competing with others for a place in the sun in this uh, sort of limits of capital accumulation here and in Latin America. Uh, in what we call this antagonistic cooperation with traditional powers. So, in this uh, logic of capitalist accumulation, I think that the Greeks uh, reproduce and they expand uh, uh, new expropriations within their own countries, so within their own Greek countries, and also in other South regions. I uh, uh, don't have time to go into the yes to this uh, whole situation of the bank, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this is what Patrick already said. And I think the chances of uh, bricks from below uh, need to come from the struggles themselves. It's not here we academics figuring out how to connect struggles, but the concrete struggles against uh, uh, extractive uh, projects, against uh, mega events, mega projects, uh, those struggles are going to be the basis for, for groups from below. And I think that we did some, in the case of Valley, with the Valley Network, and I did, I think that we did some in the campaign against Pro Savannah as examples of concrete struggles that could connect struggles within the big countries. Sorry for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I that should so long. Yeah, you have to Okay, okay. So, uh, I'm Marina Castro, and uh, I'd like to, uh, first of all, to, to say thank you for being here. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'm not uh, so good in English, so I, I wish you have the patience to try to be clear. If you cannot, please ask me to stop and just say again. I'll try to be clear, but I'm not uh, fluent in English, okay? But I'll try to do my best. I'm a professor at the rural, Federal Rural University at Rio, de right, Janeiro, and uh, I'm doing research in two different groups. One of them uh, try to think about the social changes, agribusiness in Brazil, and public policy. And they try to look at how can we this sector that is a huge molecule of brains in Brazil, we are a very powerful in this uh, sector, how they act inside and abroad with Brazilian actors fully, that's what 
pressure and make it uh, grow. Okay, and uh, I'm also uh, studying and researching in the laboratory of interdisciplinary studies in relations, uh, international relations with them. Yeah, and we we have been discussing a lot about the South-South relations. Yeah, and cooperation and what is it. And the uh, and the activists and I am part of two campaigns. One in Brazil to try to protect uh, our savanna that we call as the, the area in which uh, the grain production is, is increasing uh, very fast with the support of Japan. And uh, part of our another campaign there is no two per savanna in Mozambique and try to connect Brazil, Japan, and Mozambique also. Do you know per savanna? Have you heard about it? Yeah. I'll try to bring. Uh, think some things about it. Uh, as Anna said, we'll start from here. Yeah, it's our departure. Uh, point of departure is uh, the, the Nicalas corridor, Lomitsu Valley, actually. And uh, because in 2000, as Anna told us, uh, uh, including in the, especially in the PT government, and the Workers Party in Brazil, uh, we start to, to notice uh, that Brazil is being closer. Uh, to Africa, especially to the countries of CPAP, that speaks Portuguese. And uh, the discourse was always very horizontal. Uh, we know our problems in Brazil, yeah, we have a lot of public policies, and we know the solutions to the problems of, of, of African countries. We are in the same stage of development, so we can share and we can teach them or help them yeah, to solve the, the, the problems. Phrase that one of Brazilian foreign ministers said is that for every African problem, there is a Brazilian solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, at the same time, the time <laughs> yes, that's the, the foreign minister of the Lula yeah, government, yeah. which is a, who, who was a very left foreign minister. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, in 2004, Bali, that's a huge mining company in Brazil, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, it used to be a, a, a public, yeah, public uh, enterprise, now it's private. It start to, to exploit uh, and to extract uh, coal from Petty in the North East. And uh, there was a lot of problems with, with uh, resettlement and environmental problems, and we start to think, well, we have to go there, and we have to see what's happening, and we have to listen to people who is dealing who is facing this enterprise from the, the territory, from the, the, the fights against the, the enterprise. And then we, we went there, and we noticed that this area, Nia and Alice Corridor, is much more strategic than Valley. You know, Valley is one actor, a powerful actor, but you have a lot of more actors acting and trying to control this area. And so uh, it's now, it's my current research project that is to understand this uh, economic corridor, the economic, economic corridor, uh, in which Bali is active, act, uh, uh, in real, she's, uh, Bali is controlling the corridor with Mitsui, there's a Japanese company, it's not a coincidence. Uh, Mitsui it's, uh, has a lot of chairs of Bali and this uh, he, he, he has a site in this corridor also. And they are always transitioning shares. So it's, it's the layers of the financialization that you can see. And when it arrives in, at the territories, most of, all, of, most of the case you cannot identify which actor is doing what because they are so mixed that it's very confusing. And so now I'm trying to look to this uh, corridor, trying to, to understand Who's, uh, who are the actors that are disputing this, this uh, corridor now and what's the implication for this territory? That's okay. Can you understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, well, it's not new now. Harwin uh, is very smart and I think it's very it's brilliant to, to try to understand how the geography is in Britain. Very connected to the, the development of capitalism, the you know, like creating and destroying spaces and trying to uh, manipulate uh, the distance and the space and to turn to making things faster. Uh, I used to to uh, read a lot of uh, social scientists called Sashka Sassen that's also very close to Harvey, and she used to say, well, it's a 
the advance of capitalist uh, financialization with a lot of complexity, they advanced for the territories and destroyed traditional capitalism or traditional forms of production. And the consequence is that they expel, they don't need people anymore. You know, so they destroy people and they expel the nature. And so the land, there's land of life, it becomes land of sell. You sell the land the market, the global markets, because of the research, because of uh, all the, the, the riches that you can find there. And at the same time, you have a, a land of uh, use, and you use just to produce. You disconnect with the life, the values of life in the future. And, uh, dead land. There is the land they use to extract uh, minerals. Yeah? The mine company, they, they kill the land. Yeah? That's, uh, I think it's very important. And now we have a new geography of extraction of resource. And a new geography, a new geography of consumer of resource. Yeah? You have to think about it. And the economic corridors, they are very important because they connect things, you know. And they connect, they connect things, and they change the logic of the territory also. And this is very important. They have the hard part. There is the mining spot where you extract uh, coal, the, the railway, the ports, the gateways to the to the global markets. But they have a, a soft dimension that they change the the public policies that do, uh, that govern that area. So they try to liberalize everything. They try to, to make the distance between things and people uh, closer. Yeah, we understand. And they, they are very important for the fruits of capital and, and, and uh, products also. Yeah. And uh, the state is very important. The Mozambique states in this case is very important because he is the, the main actor who is doing, who is trying to define the place who try to organize the actors, and most of the times, they try to clean the conflicts. They try to put the conflicts outside. So there's a empty lands without people, they are not producing, and they need to transform it. So it's a discourse. It's a very important uh, role in building a discourse to legitimate that kind of project, like the development and the employment that we bring and much of the time they try to to put people, peasant people, indigenous people in Brazil like uh, out of uh, the land to to turn it simple for investment. Invest, okay. And uh, okay, and so I start to look at this place and try to just just to give you uh, points, some points of the actors, the constellations of actors that are acting in this further. We have the World Economic Forum with 17 corporations think a new vision for agriculture, try to connect the corridors with a new agriculture for this, this area, you know. They, all have, uh, uh, they have a work group to think about the infrastructure in this area, also is one of the priorities of these groups. Do you have the new alignment of G8, okay, trying to think a new agriculture for African culture in this area, it's very strong too. And they have the commitment uh, uh, from the Mozambique government to change the legislation about seeds, for example, to accept OMG's, uh, OGM's uh, seeds, okay. There is a problem for the Prosabona, for example, and I'll talk about it later. You have the African Union with Nepal, and with the cooperative African agricultural development, you have uh, in the pets, so that's the main public policies that try to, to change the Mozambique agriculture uh, from the government of Mozambique, the pets, it's part, it's aligned with this uh, huge uh, continental uh, program and dimitri. And uh, you have PIDA, you know, uh, from the African Development Bank also, and as a successor of the head. And we try to 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 bring forth this corridor as a strategic, and you have the value that is controlled nowadays, and you have the Prasavana. Prasavana, to tell about Prasavana, I have to go back to Brazil in the 70s, uh, because it's very connected to another program of cooperation between Brazil and Japan called Prodeset. I don't know, I don't, I've heard about it, no, I'm sure not. 
During the 70s, it was a huge problem in the market of soy. Yeah. Also, it was uh, in parallel with the oil prices and the, the prices skyrocketed because of uh, problems of climate problems and because of the Russia that was buying uh, soy from the United States. And Japan start to look for new uh, ways, new countries uh, to buy soy in the global market. And they didn't went to Brazil, they went to Bolivia also, they went to other countries in Latin America, and they tried to establish uh, cooperation programs uh, very aligned and, and very close with the Japanese cooperation, like Mitsui, for example, and to try to develop new technology uh, to, to create a seed of soy that is adapted to new uh, environments, new, new places, yeah? And one of these places, the strategic areas, was uh, the Cerrado Brasileiro. Nowadays, it's a, the main producer in Brazil, and Brazil is one of the huge players in the global market of soy, yeah? Uh, Argentina is another one. And from that, in this, uh, this time in Brazil, we had a dictatorship. I don't know if you have been clear. The military, they are controlling uh, the country. And so they give strong support with credit. And they start to uh, implement these projects. And now uh, we have soy everywhere. Yeah, they Singenco. There, there is a huge company in the soy market. They used to say that in Latin America we have the Republic of the Soil. And you can, yeah, you can, yeah, they can show it in the map. Now you have Bolivia, Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina. It's a huge camp of soil fields. And then in, in G8, uh, in Aquila, uh, Japan and Brazil, uh, they signed the term of compromise. Uh, there, there was planning to transport this model of cooperation to another country in Africa. They didn't know about Mozambique yet, but they decided to, de to do that in Africa somewhere. And then Brazil uh, would offer the technology uh, to, from Cerrado, and Japan would offer uh, equipment and money, and they would find a, a place, a country. Uh, later, then they decided to discuss with Mozambique because they saw uh, they took the bread and they knew about the, the savanna, the Mozambique savanna here in this area in brown. In the sea. It's the same area as, as the Nicala corridor, and they start to implement it. When you see these projects, I cannot because so just first of all, the, the master plan has 200 uh, pages, and the other ones that it was projected to this area, there's a lot of documents. But when you read it, the solution is to transform the agriculture. Transform always is that. You have to transform what you have in this place, the traditional agriculture of the peasantries, in a modernized and led market agriculture. And it's very complicated because, uh, at first, because most of times you can include some producers, but not, not all producers. You have a very traditional producers there, uh, and the agriculture that used to to change the place in which they, they plan, the huge place, because they need to, first of all, because they have to make the, the land rest in order to restore the, all the nutrients, and because most of the time they try to, to, to uh, how can I say, to manage the risk. And so when you have the changes in the, in the climate there, you have two spots in which you are planting. And uh, it's very uh, conflicting with uh, an agricultural for the market, yeah. And when you have a huge corridor there, that's not our corridor, it's the, the point, the most important point in order to, pos to turn possible to export. So all these plants try, in different articulations with different alliances, try to implement a, a model in which you have a huge area in which you, uh, in, you, you which fix uh, agriculture for uh, monoculture, agriculture for market, for exportation most of the time, and a huge corridor, uh, logistic and economic corridor in this area. 
And the other stuff one nowadays uh, is a little bit uh, paralyzed and there's a lot of uh, uh, reasons for that. Yeah, but there are, there are a lot of reasons. First of all, it's because the, the price of soil uh, comes down. The second one is because you the government, the Brazilian government, the Mozambique government, the Japan government saw uh, a rise in resistance against Barcelona from Mozambique and then later from Brazil, and also in this tri trilateral campaign. And because Brazil now is facing a huge problem, yeah, we have a coup in Brazil, we have a, a debt crisis, and we have a, 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 a political problem, and Brazil uh, refrained, yeah, paralyzed investing in this uh, program. Uh, one thing that we have to think about it in the process of any other, another uh, project like that is about the, the strategies of the corporations that are doing that. I don't think they understand that because they have a moment because they have different strategies and they change the strategies uh, as soon as they reach the territory they meet and they work with the local government most of the time, and you see there's different layers in which they act. And in the territories, most of all, in part, uh, some occasions they need labor and sometimes in them they integrate the producers, and other occasions they don't need them. And they go, there's dispossession and then they expel people from the area and go to other places. It was a big land. Uh, it's a very specific thing because they have a, a, a progressive regulation in the lands from state. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Here's the same. I don't think so. But uh, you cannot sell the land, and you can, you cannot have the land. But you can sell all the things that you made and you built in the land. And so, uh, in practice. You have an informal market of land, you know, so people are selling the, 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 the title to use the land, <coughs> and the land is still of the state, you know. And this enterprise, if you are a, a foreign company uh, arriving in Mozambique, you can have the concession of use of the land for 50 years, and you can <coughs> renovate it for what, 60, uh, 50 years. And so, uh, you have a lot of uh, conditions to do that. One of that is to make cons consultants to the communities. There are no ones. But most of the times when you go and you research and you look for these consult consults, uh, most of the time they are uh, buying support from leaders in the local. Local leaders? Okay. Sorry. And so now we have a, a huge market of land, informal markets, and uh, sometimes you have property investments, sometimes you don't have, it's just speculative, they are expected. Uh, another time in which the investment will, will arrive and you sell uh, the, 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 the right to use uh, in a better place, a better price. Well, uh, talking about the, the, this is important to think about the different strategies. Because when you think about the real steps, like, like for example, the campaign no to process money, it's a campaign that uh, starts from to, to refuse this kind of investment because they will not bring development. They will bring an uneven pattern of development, very concentrated, and uh, very uh, inappropriate to the agriculture that you have in that area. And they say, yo, we have to we start to think about development from the territory, from the practice of the people that are living, living there. And then you have to think of solutions to become uh, better, to improve their techniques, to improve their quality of life. But you have a huge resistance to be integrated into this project. And uh, you have this resistance, for example, in a cooler that is there, in, where we have the court, and they are trying to discuss and debate with the government and with the, 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 the corporation uh, better terms of inclusion. And it's a, a, a challenge that we have to, to think about it, and we have to face when we go to the territories, and most of the, the textbooks, you, 
you won't find it. When you, you listen about land grabs, you listen about the res resistance of, uh, against the land grab. But you have this other kind of, of uh, uh, resistance and we should think about it. Well, nowadays, uh, we are facing that. We are, there are two poles, of course. We have a lot of uh, different conditions between the both, but I think we have to think about it. And it's important to figure out uh, what we have in the territories and how to create a dialogue, how to create a resistance uh, that can really uh, be united against this or try to change the way things are, are, are made. You know? Uh, first of all, I'm not paralyzed, but the Mozambique government said four days ago that they will do it uh, by fire or sword. They will do it, yeah, no, no matter what, how. And uh, at the same time, in October of this year, the campaign of no to president is preparing a huge conference, a huge conference to put together Japanese uh, civil society, Brazilian civil society, and the Mozambique civil society into discuss strategies to act yeah, against <coughs> this, uh, this project. In our days, uh, even with the, the, the dialogue and the, the trying to dialogue with this project, we haven't seen much uh, changes in the way they think the development of this area. Uh, it's, much, it's, much, it's, it's much the same as in the beginning. So uh, let's see what's happening. I think it's open. Yeah, the resistance is a very strong. They have, they have power to paralyze a program like that. And they have power to change it. Yeah, and so it's an open question what is going to happen. Uh, we have to, to change it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, we haven't had much time for conversation and debates and discussions, but I think this, this kind of input, which is really a kind of perspective from below, spotlighting what are essentially capitalist states and how they operate. In advancing the interests of their multinationals and transnationals, uh, how they're engaging in local spaces, particularly in Africa and so on. So let, let's, let's get your feedback, maybe your input. Questions, comments, engagements? And you film the fact that your cameraman wants us to have some people ask the question up here. So do you mind uh, coming up this side to ask? Yeah, you can come to the front if you want to, but that's what's going to be the Okay. Come, come, come. Don't forget, go home. No long speeches because everyone should be chance. Well, I, I had a mic listening to you in the Diddy and Black Talk. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Anna, you said that in most cases, uh, companies that conduct business in Africa normally are backed up by the Brazilian government whenever it is that they have grievances to be shot with other states, given that um, they cannot be made in legal dispute with other states. As I'm assuming that's more or less what's happening. Now, my question is, what's the incentive for the Brazilian government from their own markets and companies when they now have to intervene with other states on behalf of private organizations? What does the public of Brazil get from the private sector of Brazil, given that they seem to take a backlash every time for whatever it is that Anybody else? Hi, good morning. My name is Amanda. Um, once again, thanks for, 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 for this information. Um, earlier on in your presentation, you spoke about the focus of the police presence in Africa. And you highlighted two things. Uh, they are focused more on extractive, on the extractive sector and on the infrastructure development projects. So my question is, are these development projects or infrastructure projects uh, informed by national plans or they're just a top-down thing? I'm not sure if you understand the question. And the second, I think, is for us uh, South Africans really to reflect on. While uh, the, 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 our committee was talking about this corridor thing, I was already thinking of, I'm not sure how many of us are aware of the so-called Murodo Corridor. 
And I'm not sure is it a coincidence that it was announced immediately after South Africa joined the US. So maybe we need to look at that. Maybe. Great. Uh, so yeah, sure. Did you come up the side? <laughs> it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Can you tell again the name of the courses? No, no, no. Because I'm, I'm, the way it is situated, it also connects, I think some of the destination is straight to me. Yes. Thanks, guys. I mean, um, thanks for the presentation. Again, I think it's a good descriptive, um, but it needs to be contextualized in the sense that all those infrastructure projects that you talk about, uh, they've been funded mainly by the World Bank, by the IFC, and these are Bretton Woods institutions. So I think you do, if you, because you don't state that the analysis, again, is incomplete. Secondly, uh, none of them have yet been funded by the new, new development bank. It's still very new. So again, the, the, the critique of the financial arm of BRICS, again, is still, uh, it hasn't yet funded formally, they haven't been tested in the market. All those claims that they have been uh, uh, bad for the environment they cannot start because you know, the NDB is only now operational. So I think the, 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 the analysis is we, may, we need to go one step back and look at division of power within these countries. So if you look at Odebrecht or ShopRite, Anglo, these are capitalist uh, multinational corporations that may reside in nation states, but are not necessarily owned by Brazilians or South Africans. Uh, uh, if you apply the thesis of colonization of a special type, the CST thesis, then these uh, corporations are part of global capital. Anglo-American, Odebrecht, as I understand, is a German uh, company or company, a uh, Brazilian company, but it has its roots in Germany, or it's European capital. It's not Brazilian national inclusive capital. ShopRite is Africana capital in Africa. It's still white, uh, white capital. So I think we need to dissect uh, the national division of power in each country. Otherwise, you just say Odebrecht is Brazilian. Not necessarily. But is ShopRite South African? I think it's a debate. So the. It's an incomplete analysis, and, and I think that's where the problem is. It doesn't honestly uh, talk to a sub-imperialist. It is, you can't even call it an imperialist. BRICS is not even a sub-imperialist. It's basically vested interest, uh, maybe overlapping interest by nation states. It's a mercantile project of nation states, but it definitely uh, is not um, an imperialist project. From what you say, there's no evidence, etc. Et there's a serious problem with all corporations, whether they're Chinese, Indian, American, European, in, in the African extractive sectors that have been highly exploited over one century, over the past century, uh, capital has exploited, uh, particularly mining and oil. But then to use that as a, to say, to, to conclude that BRICS is up in periods, is, it, it doesn't make sense. Empirically, sociologically, political science, I, uh, I think it's a, it's a new debate. I think we're opening the debate. But uh, we can't just draw conclusions to say, because of that, it's up in people. I think it's a wide question that through research and through evidence can only come out after many years, in my view. Excellent. Great. Uh, any one of the two last hands would get to our panel? And we have a lunch, which has been very cool. Anybody else? One last taker? Thank you. Uh, I don't know, just, just to take you also from the name. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm Gerald. Uh, I'm doing my master's. I finished my master's. I was in uh, global energy industry. Um, just to take you know, your point and your position, maybe if we can get a better understanding of what we want to get, a better understanding of what some imperialism is, we need to look at the science, you know, on how the constraint of these nations really breaks, you know, uh, bracket. We have operated within Africa, particularly the case that I know in Zimbabwe, how the Chinese investment companies have been manipulating and they've been actually encroaching within the, in, in fact, they've been abusing the, the, the social side of the citizens within the state, right? And how the government has also been quiet and how it has exacerbated aspects of corruption and bad governance and all those 
in being in the state of Zimbabwe. So probably we cannot just dismiss and say it's not Southern realism, but probably the historic point is what are the signs of Southern realism and maybe we can you know, take that as a certain point and maybe we'll have at the end of the day the conclusion that has it been in you know, the of Southern realism or maybe it's just capital investment.
pleasure to, to say. Um, so the question of the Brazilian state and how it is acting, uh, I ask myself the same thing as you. What I've been uh, researching and seeing and following and, and commonly seeing is that, and it's not something that only Brazil does, right? But others do as well, is that uh, uh, the Brazilian state sees, and it's very typical for us as former colonial countries, that it is a sign of another level of development, another level of, you know, uh, where we are in the world to have multinational cooperation. And even those, those are private corporations, some of them are state-owned, um, but some of them are private. And for the case of Odebrecht, uh, it's not even um, uh, uh, an open society. It's a state, it's just a family-owned company. It's totally Brazilian from the beginning, from the beginning, there's a family from Bahia. But uh, it is a sign that Brazil is growing and multinational corporations are like, kind of like motors of our development. Um, and it's very symbolic and it's very deep in the Brazilian common sense. It's our pride to see Petrobras or Bali <laughs> operating in Canada, in Mozambique. It's our pride to see that they are there. We are, you know, it's, it's, it's very deep in the Brazilian root of culture that we need to develop in this way. So that's, I think, you know, how the, the, the Brazilian uh, uh, state under the ruling government uh, saw the situation of really uh, structuring this agreement in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to represent private interests as nation. But the other side of it is that since Brazil didn't coordinate itself to the traditional bits with Western countries. Uh, it uh, strategically thought that if it opened the way here to do the same with other South countries, it would have to sign it with traditional powers. So I think that Brazil uh, had a strategic you know, approach in this. It said, well, I'm going to protect the Brazilian company. It's totally designed to South-South relations. This agreement is not designed for Brazilian companies in the US. It's designed to Brazilian companies in Mozambique or in, in, in Bolivia or Peru. Um, Brazil, the Brazilian state had this, I think this is strategic approach to see we are promoting and protecting our multinationals against the interpreters the, the, uh, would say arbitrarian uh, states just as Bolivia or, or Argentina, but we are not to be meeting ourselves to the multinational corporations from, from uh, the Western countries. It's more or less like this, but it's still ongoing, it's very recent. That's why we don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to be negotiated in the case of the conflict, because the conflict with Valley was already there. That's the only reason why Brazil started this with Mozambique. Oh, there, there's no other reason. It's not, it's not the main uh, country which receives Brazilian investment. This would be Angola in the case of Africa. It, this would be a South American company in general. So it's not, it's not the concrete number of Brazilian investment. It's the conflict with Vale that promoted this. And this model of Brazilian protective investment is uh, built in consulted with the Brazilian private sector. So it's totally represented there. Um, you didn't answer his question about if there were national plans in Africa, right, for these corridors and this whole infrastructure project. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's the question. No, I'm sure yeah, it's 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 oh, okay, just All right. All right. So I'm not going to be so to yeah. I think you're totally right about uh, the World Bank, and that's true. The NDB is complementary to the World Bank. It says, it says in its own words, in its interview, it is not something that is opposed or alternative to them. It is complementary to the World Bank. They share staff now. They, they share staff now. As the CRE, so it's exactly the point that we're making. I think we agree more than we think. Uh, that uh, the BRICS is acting, or the BRICS countries individually, is, they are acting within the framework that is posed there and not as an alternative to it, and that's our problem. Yes, but the caveat there is that the nations will have policy sovereignty. Whereas under the World Bank, over 50 years, they had no policy sovereignty I space. I agree that the, well, so let's see how the NDB will operate, because 
there is more space for national systems. You're right in the way they see it. But the project, yeah. No, no, no. You're right. Who is national was my next point about the companies. But on the other hand, the design of this project. Who wants an infrastructure project in Akala in this way? But who is going to finance? Will be either the NDB or the or or a private bank or or the or the World Bank. But the problem is how these projects are being designed in, in, in which structure in the world economy to exploit these resources to the international market the way they're doing. You know, it's building an expiction of peasants, exploiting the workforce, etc. So that's no the whole point. And concerning the companies, um, I think that well, in the traditional literature, you can differentiate between multinational and transnational corporations. And in the case of, of the BRICS multinationals, they are multinationals, as in the US case. They are not transnational. They are not built of you know, many different financial capital mixing there. They have their own state bases. Some of the companies are state-owned. Some of the companies are open and they have shares uh, 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 from other other uh, uh, actors such as Vali. Vali has, has been privatized in the 90s. It has an open, uh, uh, how do you say, that the, the main shares are open. So that Litsu is part of Vali. Now it's even more privatized there. But its headquarters are in Brazil. Its decisions are made there. And it's made with the Brazilian government together. So it's you know, I think complicated to determine that companies are national or not national. I think the companies they operate multinationally, right? But not totally uh, uh, dissociated from their states of origins. Not even the U.S. companies. Do. So I think we need to to uh, to think a little more about uh, nationalities in the same sense that the the Greeks really keep so much space for national decision making. I think, yeah. Very quickly, let me take up two things because the bricks from below idea, uh, Vishwas has invited you to think about um, maybe in this seminar, we should maybe open it to the activists of, Dur of Johannesburg. Um, and what we did in Durban in 2013, led by uh, two civil society, no, uncivil society groups. Uh, one is called SETSI, South Durban Community Environmental Alliance. The other is called brown work. They don't wear suit and ties and go to civil bricks, civilized bricks, which is a basically Putin-created uh, puppy dog uh, NGO network. Um, we have one member here. I won't mention them for sake of embarrassment. Um, but actually, you can walk across this campus, not quite the Unsmuts uh, Avenue, which you can find the Unsmuts house, and you will find bricks from the middle, putting on a, 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 a brick civil hat there. It's just extraordinary. Anglo-Americans, house think tank of sub imperialism during the old days, has easily switched to become the major institution in the BRICS think tank network and in civil bricks. I'm speaking of Sia. I might as well call it for you. And, and I think uh, it's going to be critical because Ashraf is in this very interesting network at NIST. I think we all know the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. There's a lot of radical rhetoric. Its chairperson is Ari Sitas, right? Its uh, director, Sarah Swetsa. They've actually funded some bricks from below work. So watch the space over the coming months, because exactly the kind of third world is pro-bricks, keep an open mind material you're getting from Ashraf, which is usually a failure to look at the details. Like, Ashraf, it, you won't find this written down on Google. You have to go to the YouTube to find what K.D. Kamat said he wanted to do with the BRICS New Development Bank Africa Regional Center. We know the director, right, the managing director of that branch is, what's his name? Somebody said Ntong Van Nene. Ntong Van Nene was going to be given that job. What's his job now? He's head of Pitts Business School, so we, we see a lot of him. The point being, this is a, a multiple scam. Ashraf, how many local staff are in the African Regional Center in Santa? Exactly none. They come from Shanghai, right? When will the, man, the manager be um, uh, brought in to, to run the BRICS New Development Bank? 
They've had two applications. Go to the Bridge Student Development Bank website, you'll see it. But go to the YouTube speech by KD Kamat, the head of the Bridge Student Development Bank, Ashraf. See what he says he wants this bank to do in the next um, two years. He wants 1.5 billion, in fact, 18 months, 1.5 billion dollars. Why does he use dollars? Because hmm? if we're building infrastructure projects with local labor, local steel, local cement, we obviously need to borrow dollars, right? No, it's absurd. So Kamath does recognize that's a problem. So he's talking about maybe one day raising a rand loan. He's, he's raised a yuan loan. But these are the most crucial details. And please look to see what he says he wants to finance. He's given a direct mandate. You can see it in the YouTube. What does the new development bank finance in this country in the next uh, 18 months? ESCOM, transit. He said, he said the pig sips. And what are the two big pig sips? Please, folks, learn this. If you are students, you want fees to fall? What do we need? We need about 40 billion rand a year. Where's the money going? What's the biggest project? OK, let's say nuclear doesn't happen, because we're in your background. But the projects that are on the books, 800 billion rand to export 18 billion tons of coal. Who benefits? Oak Bay. So this is Zupta project. Who also benefits? BHV Billiton, Anglo Coal, right? These are, which is now owned by an Indian, 13%, Vedanta, I call Anil Agarwal. So we're finding the three brothers state capture. Who are the three brothers? Where do they live? Somebody said Gupta, Saxmo, Rom. No, the three brothers are in Manhattan. You know their names. Yeah, you do. Who, who are the three brothers in Manhattan? We've done state capture so completely, starting with Derek Keyes right through to um, Lucy Vicabi. You know their names. Standard and poor speech and movie. Now, they've done state capture just as well as the subject of right? Now, if you put that together, you get the World Bank with its largest loan, right? Financing what? Hitachi and Chancellor House. Right? Multinational capital and local corruption. Don't ask me if it's corrupt. They've been sued and had to pay a $20 million fine to the United States uh, Securities and Exchange Commission for bribery. Now, the BRICS NDB fits exactly there, exactly within that. But the, to the extent, Ashraf, that when um, Jim Young Kim, the head of the World Bank, met KV Kamaf last year, they said, hey, we'll share our stuff, we'll share our projects, we'll share our operating procedures, you guys are just a bunch of youngsters. And uh, KV Kamaf and these guys were delighted. And they said, yes, not only that, we're going to raise money with an international credit rating from the three brothers from Manhattan. This is an interlinked group, Ashraf, that gives each other nurturing, finance, and legitimacy to come to Santon a month ago to set up a bank branch that's empty to finance these ghastly projects. Project number two, 250 billion, is the Durban Big Out Port, which is hotly contested by the uncivil society folk in, in, South, in South Durban. So we will see from these kinds of projects and a brilliant international networking from below that we've, we've seen with the Vale project, that we've seen with the uh, Anta Pro Silvana project, and Trevor and Guani was part of that in Goa last year, and I took two PhD students from, from this, this year, you know their names, Roy Chivanku and the um, producer of Big Debate, and Cashman, uh, a couple of weekends ago, to see the most courageous Asian activists struggling against a sub-imperial bricks of Dalton Road, it's going to make their lives so much worse. And there's just no time anymore, Ashraf, given the preponderance of evidence on climate change, the catastrophic threat to your generation, the fees must fall cost 40 billion. Why are we putting 800 billion into coal exports? That'll kill your generation, right? With no students yet standing up and making the link, thinking globally, thinking about generational rage you should have against my generation for wrecking your future by taking the money from Fees Must Fall and putting it into fossil-centered big infrastructure for Oak Bay, BHP Billiton, and Anglo. And it's that spirit, Ashraf, that means we've got to get rid of this on the fence, middle of the road, it might get better stuff. Eh? The BRICS from the middle is bankrupt. I even did, I did a big uh, report for the BRICS trade union forum, and they are absolutely dug in 
to being uh, part of that Chinese project. Right? Uh, so I would just say, let's do the next stage, which is uniting all of our ideas about critique and resistance. And it'd be great to have Rick from the middle continue to come. But really, I hope we're convincing you, dear comrades. This is not a situation of anti-imperialism in Victoria and the others. It's uh, stuff. OK, so let's, let's thank them for inciting us. So during lunch, let's exchange some ideas and how we continue this conversation next year. And South Africa is hosting the Brick Summit. So I'm open to ideas.